All right, we're gonna call to order the February 17th meeting of the West Sacramento City Council and Redevelopment Agency. We're gonna ask our guests to join the council and staff in the pledge, which tonight will be led by Ms. Jerry Wingfield. The council did meet in closed session this evening to provide direction to staff regarding terms uh, per the item in our closed session agenda the, for the sale of 1235 Harbor Boulevard, and uh, no final action was taken at that time. All right, that brings us to item 1A, which is presentations by the public on matters not on the agenda but within the jurisdiction of the city council. As is noted on our agenda, we're not uh, uh, permitted under state law from taking up or having a discussion about the items that are brought up under 1A, but it is provide an important opportunity for a public forum. We do ask that anyone wishing to address the council on this or any other item this evening to please fill out one of the yellow cards that's available at the door and to turn it into the city clerk. In front of the clerk is a timer that we use to make sure that everyone has a chance to be heard. And so to that end, we ask that all comments be limited to no more than three minutes. On our regular agenda items, we take the uh, speaker request cards up through the conclusion of the staff report. So once the uh, staff report is concluded and the city council begins asking questions and we take public comment, we don't take any additional cards. So if you see an item on the agenda that you think you might wanna speak on, uh, just be sure to get, get the card in prior to the time that the staff person's uh, done with the, uh, with the presentation. Uh, we also recognize that for some folks speaking in public and on TV, to Olympic-sized audiences can involve some anxiety. And so we do ask that there not be any boos or applause or cat calls and that we try to maintain a civil discourse here in the chambers. So with that, we do have uh, several requests to speak under item 1A and the first one is by Mr. Bill Lowell. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. William Lowell, West Sacramento for the record. Uh, I probably mentioned this or made reference to it more than once before, but uh, in the last couple of days, I noticed on the news, uh, State Senate President Pro Tem Daryl Steinberg has been calling for restoration of uh, uh, franchise tax board auditors because they're funded differently than the rest of them. And, and besides that, they, pr they produce revenue for the state, so I, I don't understand the rationale for uh, cutting those that staff back. And again, going back to my experience from the early 60s, when we when I learned they weren't even auditing tax returns prepared by professionals, well, the state continues to lose over five billion a year because of that, according to the outgoing head of franchise tax board. When uh, Governor Arnold took office, so uh, if we want to really get real, uh, I mean, let's, otherwise let's change the law and start bragging about it that we don't audit tax returns. And, uh, let's, let's start collecting taxes according to the rules and, or change the rules. Thank you. All right, thank you, Mr. Lowell. Just remind folks that the, the item uh, 1A is for presentations on matters within the jurisdiction of the city. So we do, we have a pretty broad definition of what that is, um, but uh, we, we unfortunately don't have the power to control issues at the state or federal governments or at the United Nations. All right, John Basharian, JB. Good evening. I'm here to say thank you to the council and to uh, the city manager for as following up as far as you have regarding our bright post office and its pending closure. I've uh, been told by a uh, employee of the Postal Service, who shall remain unnamed, that uh, Zuby has told that would be the uh, uh, West Sacramento um, uh, postmistress that uh, she is closing the, the post office on at the end of March or in March is all I know. I'm assuming that we'll get a 30 day notice either the first or the second. The owner of the property has been told that there will be nothing paid after the 30th of April. Apparently the survey that they just recently took was pro forma. I don't know what else can be done. I'm hoping that the council will seriously consider 
following up with uh, Mike Thompson and whomever else you feel that you can have any uh, influence with to uh, try and keep our uh, branch open. I suggested to the owner that if the very, if the very worst happens that uh, he consider turning that into a, an operation such as mailboxes, et cetera, used to be. And I was hoping that if the city council looked kindly on that, that there was some arrangement that could be made to enable him to do that without losing money. I don't know what else to say, but thank you. We've been trying to keep this open for a long time. If anyone has any ideas, you know how to reach me. And if there's a point person on this, uh, perhaps you should talk to me privately. Thank you. Right. Mr. Chairman, thanks for your leadership in the community on the issue. Uh, ben Davis, Jr. As Mr. Davis is coming up, I don't know if anyone's here from, I've gotten a couple of communications that some of the Google Fiber uh, proponents were gonna be here, but this would be the item that you would wanna speak on if you were gonna speak, and you have uh, two speakers left to get a card in. So this would be the moment. Mr. Davis, welcome. Thank you for the opportunity to um, bring my family home to your attention again. I'm Ben Davis, Jr., born and raised in Broderick. Um, I'm here tonight because I did uh, finally get an answer from Mr. Wright about the my request that I made 10 months ago about reapplying for the program. And I want to put it in perspective first by saying that you'll remember that I requested a, a leave to reapply for this program, even though there were some restraints on it that would have applied to me otherwise. And I uh, suggested that perhaps some of your staff was misleading you as to my position, and um, perhaps even purposefully so. As a result of that, you had Mr. Wright discuss this with me. Um, Mr. Wright concentrated on the issue of staff misleading the council. I said I was happy to go along with that, but my main issue was whether or not I could reapply or request an answer to my question. He looked into that and um, gave me an answer within a month or so after uh, taking care of your business, and uh, the answer was I would be able to reapply, but it was, he wanted to look into it further, particularly before he gave me a letter to reapply. He wanted to know whether or not I would be able, whether the there would still be funds so that if my application was approved, there would be funds to buy the home. Well, as it was, it took in the neighborhood of eight months for the whole process and something like six months to determine whether there were funds. And the six months that it took to determine whether there were funds, the funds evaporated. And I was told one week after they were gone that I could reapply. This is not I, I, I feel as bad about this as I did the rest of the operation. Here another, this has been two years of my life I've spent largely coming and discussing it with you, and I don't feel like I'm being treated fairly. Honestly, I will say I've been treated. I felt very good about Mr. Wright's participation in this. He's a, he's a good city employee. But one thing he brought to my attention in particular that I want to bring before your, uh, uh, the council in this minute that I have left is that he said that they were not funded based on a criteria of considering you know, various people competing for these funds. We missed by less than 1%. Now, the state home program that denied us these loans, I've been putting under scrutiny for the last year, just as I've been putting your staff under scrutiny. I've had legislators looking into this whole thing and their mishandling of the affair. I'm afraid I just don't have enough belief in the people I've dealt with with the state to think that my, uh, association with West Sacramento could have influenced that 1%. 1% of what? I'm not even sure. If I'm making myself clear, I wonder if the state denied us funds based on a slim margin because they knew it would fund me and that they would have to go against their own guidelines to provide those funds. It's possible, and I want to know for sure that I didn't have that impact, not only because of me, but because of all the other neighbors in West Sacramento that could have uh, availed themselves of those funds. I've sent a letter to Mr. Wright. He's partially answered it, but concentrating on specifically who in the state denied us those funds and specifically what criteria they used to deny them is what I'm trying to get at. And I will hope for you and your staff support in getting answers to those questions. Right. Thank you Thank very you, Mr. much. Davis. And uh, Tom uh, Martin? Oh, was it Tom Martin? Oh. <laughs> it's Tom Martin, all right, welcome. <laughs> hey guys, how you doing? I'm here to bitch. And I got some encouraging words from Oscar already, so I appreciate that. A week before the storm, I lost 40% of an 80-foot mulberry out of my rental yard. 
still on my neighbor's truck. Lo and behold, I call a guy out. He's up in the tree in the middle of the night with a headlight on to secure the tree so it doesn't fall anymore. Needless to say, the news is talking about a big windstorm. I contacted the, the fellow that trimmed my tree up to make it safe, and I got the neighbors all together. And we discussed it because the house doesn't have any air conditioning, plus it shades four houses in the neighborhood. Well, lo and behold, two weeks after the big storm, I talked to Will uh, William there at the store, Mr. Kristoff. I get a letter from the city stating that I illegally removed a tree, illegally cut a branch. So the, their definition was a heritage tree or a landmark tree. So Google's a great thing. So I get on Google and I look up California heritage trees, which is an oak. I looked up California landmark trees, which a tree it can be a landmark tree if it has historical value for the state of California, or is designating east or west property lines. So I did a little more research, and back in 1939, Grandma Dalcini planted that tree. And my wife's grandparents moved in right after that, shortly after, I think it was in the middle 40s, like the tree kept it. So I called Dina, I said, Dina, what do I do? She says, well, we'll waive the fee if you come in and fill out a permit. So I get the permit, go home, fill it out, mail it in, go on vacation, get back Sunday. I got a letter, registered letter, from the city stating I failed to comply. So now if I don't comply by the 17th, which is today, you're gonna give me a nasty fine. So I called Dina, and I don't know who dropped the ball, whether it's a post office, whether it's a city office, whether it was Dina, whether it was code enforcement, don't have a clue. So Dina says, okay, come back in, fill out the permit, we'll waive the fee again. So I do that. So today I get the letter back, my permit, great job. That's stating now that I have to plant a tree within 30 days. And I haven't even decided what I'm gonna do with that yard yet. And the tree has to meet a maturity of 35 feet tall. Well, I already lost one tree that fell on the neighbor's truck and the insurance company's telling me it's an act of God. So when they, the other insurance company came after me for the truck, I told them, call God, he's the one that dropped the tree. So now you're telling me that you, wanna, you want me to plant a tree within 30 days when I haven't decided where I wanna go with my sidewalk, the driveway, none of this stuff yet. And it has to be 35 foot tall. I, I want a tree there. The house doesn't have any electric or any air conditioning, but I want to plant a tree in front of my window there to keep the residents cool. The house is thoroughly insulated in the walls and in the attic, so I don't need the great big giant shade tree to shade everybody else's yard. So I'm asking for somebody to give me some leeway here until I can decide whether I want to put a driveway in, a sidewalk in, a walkway in, and where I want to plant a tree. So that's all I'm asking. So if somebody can get back to me on that, I'd appreciate it. Thanks, Chris. Thank you, Mr. Martin. Chris, <laughs> yes, I'm a lot older since you ran against me. <laughs> all right, those are all the requests under public comment. Uh, Mr. Ross, on that last item, um, can you look into this? We'll, we'll get back to him. All right, and so you, while, while, you're, while you're looking into this in terms of the, the expiration of the enforcement order for today, you'll be able to hold that. Right. Okay, yes. and then let, let the council know in our briefing. Yep. Thank you very much. All right, that brings us to item 1B, which is council communications. Are there any reports or other communications this evening? Uh, Mr. Kristoff. Um, yes. <coughs> yes, February 12th, the West Sacramento JPA met, and the um, major discussion was the GRR, and we do have uh, Frank Bacola going to speak on that. It's a, an agendized item, so uh, I'll let him do that instead of me. Thank you. Are there reports or communications? Okay. Um, the Board of Directors of the Capital Corridor um, Rail Service met this morning in Sassoon City. Um, the primary issue is, will be of not surprise to the Council, because the Capital Corridor is essentially a transit operation. And so the Governor's proposal to wipe out state support for transit um, would take out about half the revenue to run the train system between here and uh, between Auburn and San Jose. Um, and the other half of that comes from fares. There's no other um, uh, dollars that are uh, regional or local dollars are put into that. And so if it occurs, um, then we're looking at having to cut from about 32 trains a day to 16 trains a day round trip, which would be a massive change for a lot of the folks that have come to um, rely on that service. Um, and uh, so it's, it's a significant uh, problem. The Senate, I think as the council's aware, the state Senate's got another alternative package that does a little bit less damage to transit 
um, but doesn't keep it whole. And uh, so it's, it continues to be a major, the same challenges we're facing on buses and on everything else is, is happening at the Capitol Corridor as well. Yeah, it's, it is. I mean, the uh, I mean, states adopted a series of aggressive policies around climate change and transit usage and housing and everything else. And uh, this goes. I mean, all of this this suite of actions goes in exactly the opposite direction. But it's quite frustrating. But at this point, I mean, there there's the litigation that's been filed, and that the Transit Association has won against the governor. I think now three times. But the, you know, this this latest plan would just eliminate the gas tax altogether and then reimpose it under a different name. So that the so transit is no longer constitutionally protected, but it, yeah, I mean, for the for all of those players, given what they've done on all these other policies, it, it's pretty hypocritical. Um, then uh, last week, uh, I traveled to Washington D.C., uh, booking the flight before we knew that it was going to be the worst uh, snow since well ever ever recorded. So Mr. Lucan from the por the port manager and um, Mr. Panos, the the director of public works, and I traveled to D.C. Um, to spend a week lobbying a federal government that was closed for the entire week um, in, in Washington, D.C. But it actually turned out uh, well because most of the people were actually still there, um, particularly on Capitol Hill. Our congressional visits um, essentially all occurred anyway. Uh, and we had a lot more time, uh, relaxed time, with congressional staffers than we would have otherwise because they had nothing else to do because no one else could get to them. And uh, the actual members of Congress weren't there to distract from the business of the place. So uh, we had some very productive meetings with them as well as with a, with, a, with a handful of the agencies. And our agenda was around a couple of issues. First, with respect to um, the port, we were making a pitch for the uh, president's budget. The president has included $12.5 million in the budget for the channel deepening. Um, and so we were uh, making a pitch to members of Congress around that. And we were building, I think we, as I reported to the Port Commission earlier, we, I think we had a lot of um, receptive offices from throughout the Capitol because we've been pushing this project for, you know, 25 years. But the city in particular over the last couple of years since we took control of the port, I think has really raised the profile um, of, that, of that project. But also we, we uh, got some new members of Congress more actively engaged in it during the last week's visit. So $12.5 million for the port. And then on, the, um, on flood protection, on the dollars, we were principally interested in getting money for the slipper, the continuation of the slip repairs project at the 400-year levy, and uh, and then secondly, getting the, which is in the president's budget, and then getting uh, additional money for the GRR, the General Reevaluation Re Report, which we're going to hear an update on in just a moment. So 8.65 million dollars for that project. And again, we've we've done enough work in D.C. that there's. Uh, you know, when you go to a, a, a senator's office or a congressional office or the core elsewhere, they know the project, they know why it's necessary, they appreciate that we don't come there, you know, every five minutes and say, well, we would like a levy and then tomorrow we'd like a child care center and then the day after that we want to park. You know, we're very focused. We, we need to get these levies done and we need the port to be not, uh, you know, to be a, an effective contributor and not a bankruptcy. And that's all we're asking for and we're going to keep asking you that for the next 15 years uh, in order to complete these projects. And so it was a, uh, on both scores, it was a successful visit. And then we, we did make a little um, show of, of uh, going to the Federal Transit Administration to turn in the, uh, to, to make the pitch for the streetcar application, which was due last Wednesday. Our application did go in. Um, and we also pitched that project on Capitol Hill. And at least we got preliminary indications from the staff of Senator Feinstein of Oxer and Congressman Thompson and Congresswoman Matsui that they'd be prepared to, you know, to weigh in on behalf of that project as well. So that's a $25 million grant proposal to get the streetcar under construction no later than the end of next year. So it's, it's obviously, it would be a huge project if that were to occur. So it was actually, at, uh, and we did work on, on the, the White House executive order that we've talked about several times here as well, and FEMA remapping to try to, um, you know, avoid some of the potentially catastrophic consequences of the, bu of the bureaucracy around floods, not the floods themselves, with, and I think we continue to make, make progress in that arena. So it was a good visit. We did not talk about TIGER, which is the, the um, other big grant, and to d because uh, we'd understood that there was gonna be an announcement this week, and it's true, the Secretary of Transportation today announced um, all the TIGER awards across the country, which <coughs> are hotly competitive, and the Secretary awarded $30 million to us in a partnership with the courts of Oakland and Stockton. About a third of that money will come to us. Um, to build, to create a marine highway where containers can be barged from Oakland. The Port of Oakland 
up the ship channels to the ports of Stockton and the ports of West Sacramento, which our estimates are will take, you know, at capacity, will take over a million tr truck trips off of the highways, um, and uh, pr over a million truck trips per year, and over 660 tons of air pollution out of our air in this region um, per day. Um, so it's a very big project. And I think, importantly, that plus the $12.5 million for channel deepening really puts the federal government's flag in our port. It says we're, you know, we're, 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 we're going to be investing over $20 million in the port of West Sacramento. That's more than we've spent, I think, it, 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 um, uh, all put together since the port was actually built. Um, so it's a, big, it's a big step forward, and it was a very positive announcement today. So. Right, if there's no other communications, item 1C is com appointments to boards and commissions. I do have three this evening of the, for the three vacancies. For the, and the um, applications have all been at the council. Uh, I think the most recent ones have been since uh, the end of uh, January. So did the Agricultural and Natural Resources Commission be appointing Dean Grafilo uh, to the Library Advisory Board, uh, Susan Martimo, uh, and to the Economic Development Advisory Commission, Nicholas Chiaro. Uh, Mr. Chiaro would be the first major employer. He's the, the vice president for Hunter Douglas, which is one of our major manufacturers in town. It's a good addition, I think, to, to, to EDAC. To, to have that perspective there as well. So those would be the three appointments I'd make and ask if there's a motion to confirm them. Second. It's been moved by Mr. Beers and seconded by Mr. Christoph. There's no discussion. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye, any opposed, hearing none, that motion carries. That brings us to item two, which is consideration of a proclamation declaring March 2010 as Women's History Month. Is there a motion on the proclamation? Second. It's been moved by Mayor Pro Tem Viegas and seconded by Mr. Christoph. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye, aye any opposed, hearing none, that motion carries. And I'm guessing that Ms. Mrs. Bissell and Ms. Bigginfield are both here to accept the proclamation on behalf of the organizers. So come to the podium. All right, so we've just adopted, and I would like to present to two of the outstanding leaders in our community who've been working on this, uh, on uh, Yolo County Women's History Month, not just this year, but for a very long time in producing um, programs that have, I think, brought to the forefront uh, the important historical contributions, but also the current contributions um, that women in our community, our county, and our nation make, and the importance of those to the su continued success and prosperity of, of, uh, of, our, of our community and our country. So I'd like to read the proclamation into the record and then invite both of our guests, Jerry Wingfield and, and Louisa Vassell, to make a couple of comments if they'd like. So this is a proclamation of the West Sacramento City Council uh, proclaiming March 2010 as Women's History Month uh, for writing women back into history. Whereas American women of every race, class, religious, and ethnic background have made significant contributions to the growth and strength of this country. And whereas American women continue to serve a critical role in the economic, cultural, and social fabric of our society, both inside and outside of the home. And whereas historically, American women were the pioneers in establishing uh, charitable, philanthropic, and cultural institutions, and served as early leaders in the forefront of every progressive social change movement. And whereas women have changed America not only by securing voting rights for women, but in abdicating for civil rights, women's health issues, legal rights of battered women, and environmental justice. And whereas the impact of the pursuit for women's equality has had a profound and undeniable influence on all aspects of American life. And whereas the theme for 2010 and the 30th anniversary of the Women's History Month celebration, Writing Women Back Into History, honors the tireless work of thousands who want to ensure that accomplished women are recognized in history. And whereas the knowledge of women's history provides a more expansive view of what a woman can do, and this perspective provides encouragement to girls and women and provides boys and men a fuller understanding of the female experience, thus building a stronger community for all. And whereas when the Women's History Month celebrations began in the early 80s, the topic of women's history was limited to college curricula. And at that time, less than 3% of the, co of, the, of the content of teacher training textbooks mentioned the contributions of women, especially women of color and women in fields such as math, science, and art. And this limited inclusion of women's accomplishments deprives students of viable female role models. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the City Council of the City of West Sacramento recognizes the month of March 2010 as Women's History Month in West Sacramento and invites all citizens to join us in recognizing the 30th anniversary celebration of Women's History Month and its theme of writing women back into history. Mm. You. <laughs> I, actually, I was reading that, though. Okay. I'm going to read this because okay. it's really tricky. <laughs> Thank you for getting this in the right. 
area for me. The theme for this year's Women's Yolo County History Month luncheon is Riding Women Back into History, celebrating the contributions of women throughout history. Ramona Prieto, Assistant Commissioner of Leadership Development and Communications of the California Highway Patrol and a Yolo County resident, uh, is the honorary chair and the guest speaker at our luncheon, which will be held next month. Uh, Commissioner Prieto was appointed as the first female assistant commissioner in the history of the CHP and was also the first female motorcycle officer in the history of the CHP, breaking through a 51-year tradition of male-only motorcycle enforcement. The annual luncheon, and we hope everyone will come to enjoy it with us, is scheduled for March 11th and will be held at the Woodland Community and Senior Center, uh, 2001 East Street in Woodland. The cost of the lunch is $20. Uh, Dolly Pritchard Huber is chairwoman for the planning committee and the assistance of several officers, including Louisa Vassell, next to me, representing the West Sacramento Historical Society. Proceeds from the luncheon will benefit public libraries in Yolo County, which includes the Yolo County uh, branch, Turner, uh, Arthur F. Turner Library here in West Sacramento, our brand new library, uh, for the purchase of women's history materials. So if you'd like to know more about it or sign up for it, please get in touch with me or Louisa Fassell or Dottie Pritchard, and we're all in the phone book. Thank you. Or the phone book. Hold on a second. The website is oh, you <laughs> www. Want yes, I want the website. The <laughs> www.ycwhn, Yolo County Women's History Month. <laughs> dot org. All right. I thought that was too long to say. No. Okay. <laughs> All right, with that, we're going to proceed to item three, which is presentation of a status report on the U.S. Army Corps' general reevaluation report. Mr. Panos. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of the City Council. Um, previously, the City Council has asked for regular updates on our flood control program. Uh, staff has provided regular updates in tonight's briefing from uh, the, the USAC, the Corps, uh, United States Army Corps of Engineers as part of that effort. Um, we are partnering with the, with the uh, Corps to reevaluate our levy system, and uh, the reevaluation will lead to a Corps Chief's report, which then subsequently leads to a project authorization from Congress. So tonight we have Andrew Muha, who's the lead planner for the Corps here in Sacramento, and Frank Piccola the Chief of Planning um, for the Corps in Sacramento. And Frank has prepared a short briefing on the general reevaluation re report, and so I'll invite Frank up. Welcome back. Mr. Mayor, Council Members. Uh, Mr. Panos gave a very good report. Are there any questions? No. Oh, I, I didn't prepare. Is it done yet? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. What did they tell you when you were in Washington? Uh, probably not. <laughs> Uh, Mr. Kristoff knows it's going to take a little longer than that. Uh, the package that I prepared, I am not going to uh, quote for you verbatim because it's kind of lengthy, but I did su supply it to the clerk so that you can, everybody can have their copies. Uh, again, this is our quarterly update, and uh, this is just an overview of where we are, what we need to do, and uh, what the future looks like for us on this project. So if I get the first slide, uh, I guess it's actually the second slide. Uh, it's a summary of the previous presentations. We are here back in October. We uh, committed to coming back to the City Council uh, every quarter and, and giving an update and, and entertaining any questions. Uh, at that time, we gave you an idea of what the process was in, in a very broad sense. 
And uh, I know you all are very familiar with that at this point. So next slide talks about our current activities. We're heading toward what we refer to lovingly at the Corps of Engineers as the F3 milestone, F standing for feasibility, uh, at which point we will determine the without project condition. Now, I know that sounds like a lot of uh, garbledy gook, but it's very important to the Corps of Engineers. We have to establish what the without project will be so that we can measure alternative futures. Uh, because that eventually will become important to all of us because that will be translated into costs. Uh, as we all know, there are many different ways to solve the problems of flooding in, in the Central Valley and in, in particular in West Sacramento. And our planners, like Andrew, will come up with an array of, of possible alternatives and will measure each one of those alternatives against the future without a project. And then we'll decide what the costs were and then we'll select what is the most efficient solution. Uh, efficient meaning biggest bang for the buck. Uh, it's critical for us because we use that again as a baseline um, and we'll have a couple more slides showing the actual planning process and the next one is what we affectionately refer to as the beehive and it just summarizes the process we go through and you'll notice as we move down through the various steps there's a corresponding arrow that moves back up the steps <laughs> and that sounds just like federal government doesn't it? You never um, get out of this process right? It, <laughs> I'm glad you noticed that, and I'm sure you've experienced it, right? Everything comes in, nothing goes out. It is not meant to depict that. <laughs> what it is meant to depict is that uh, at any one of these steps, there may be an occasion or a need, a necessity to go back to the previous step to reanalyze something. Let's, for example, we may decide that we've got the perfect array of plans. We, our team, which includes representatives from the city, uh, we've decided we've come up with the very best plans in the world. We send our plans out to the public, and the public comes back and says, you know what, you forgot this plan. You forgot to think about that. And then we scratch our heads and go, you know what, they have a very good point. Maybe we need to look at another alternative plan. So we go back a step. Uh, it's not meant to be an endless loop, and I hope it does not become that. Uh, you know, once you factor in funding and what goes on in Washington, and we all have very little control over, it may seem like that sometimes. It's endless. But it's just basically to show what our process is, and then there may be reconsiderations depending on what input we get from the public and, and other agencies, state and federal agencies, and so on. Okay, so what's the point of planning? Uh, I, I, we don't even have to look at the federal government. We can look at the state government right now. We're, we're all being bombarded daily with uh, uh, news articles about peripheral canals and moving water here and moving it there and everybody's got the best idea how to move that water from one place to another and is it good for fish and is it good for people is it good for farming what, you know, what's it good for the YOLO bypasses uh, in many of these articles well that's what planning is all about we need to look at what is the best plan and again the best plan uh, in our case for the federal government is what's the best expenditure of federal dollars what do we get the most bang for the buck for most benefits versus the least cost and there's an actual process we go through. Uh, we will listen to all the stakeholders, not only the federal agencies, state agencies, but the public. Uh, certainly, we send our documents out after they're in draft form for public comment, uh, just as you do in the city. Uh, and then we'll determine what is referred to as a locally preferred plan, which means that the federal government may have a plan, but the city of West Sacramento may have a slightly different plan. And that's fine, and that's perfectly allowable. Uh, and we'll analyze both of those, and generally what uh, happens is that the difference in cost between what the federal government says we will participate in and what the city says they'll participate in, uh, there's a differential in cost. The city will pay the difference. Uh, they'll pay up to the, the, federal, to the uh, locally preferred plan. And you may want to do that. You may have a plan for the waterfront that really doesn't affect flood control directly, but you may want to uh, offer that little bit extra of, of uh, protection because of your, your larger plan. And the federal government may not see that as being necessarily beneficial to us, but we're willing to, when we let our construction contracts, to make that part of our project as well. But that's kind of down the road a couple of years. Okay, step one. Uh, problems and opportunities, we're there right now. Uh, problems are generally uh, designated as negatives. We have a problem, we have floods, we have uh, risk to the public and, and property. Opportunities are positive. We may have ecosystem and recreation uh, potentials in this project. Um, without knowing clearly what the problems and opportunities are, uh, there is no reason for planning. There's, there's 
we can just leap out and try to fix something and then find out a couple of years from now that really probably wasn't the best solution. The next step is our uh, inventory and forecast. We have to go out and figure out what's there right now. That will be a short process because we've been working in West Sacramento now for quite a while. I think we all know what's out there. We don't have to go in inventory too much. And we have to forecast the future. We have to see what will happen both if we build a project and if we don't build the project. And I think we can guess at what that is, but we have to quantify it. Next is uh, there's a lot of hydrology. That's the starting point for most of the engineering. Uh, we have to look at where the water is and where it goes and under what conditions does it go wherever it does go. You know, what kind of storm, storm centerings and high flow uh, certain, uh, situations and so on. And then the last bullet we have, there's coincident frequencies. Those are when all the bad things come together at one time. You have a big storm, the snow melts, and all the bad things, and the storm is right over West Sacramento. That's, that's kind of coincident. You got water coming in from the American River and from the Sacramento, and maybe backing out of the, uh, the wetlands. Next, we're gonna do a geotechnical. That's looking at the dirt that's out there right now uh, to see what these levees are made out of and how we can make them better. Uh, we're gonna do soil borings and all kinds of geotechnical analyses. Hydraulics. Uh, that is, the models are mentioned here. HEC-RAS is a model that we use from the uh, Hydrologic Engineering Center in Davis. We use their models uh, to determine what the floodplains look like. Uh, and I'm sure West Sacramento will be very interested to know where the floodplains are from the Corps of Engineers standpoint, not necessarily FEMA. They have a whole different purpose in life than we do. Uh, and then we'll generate a risk analysis, and that's important. Who is at risk in the community? How many people are at risk? And what do we estimate that risk to cost? and then we'll try to reduce that risk as greatly as we possibly can. Uh, and I will probably caution you at this point that I don't think any of us with the best of intentions will ever get the risk down to zero in any community, not just this community. Uh, to guarantee there will be no risk of flood under any circumstance is quite a, quite a statement, and I don't think any of us want to stand up and say that. So there will always be a risk, but if we can get it down to a very small number, that would be, uh, that would be we'll be executing our public charge. Economics, very important to the Corps of Engineers because we have to decide um, what's a good federal investment. How much money does the federal government want to spend? Uh, there are many projects that we uh, partner with uh, the state of California and communities, and they're good projects. They're very good projects, uh, but the federal government won't pay for the whole thing because our interest is slightly different. We look at a national and a federal uh, interest rather than a local or regional interest. Uh, we determine that by using a lot of existing data. We get that from your community, what's the property and how many people and so on. And we actually verify it with ground truthing. We send ec economists driving around and uh, doing what we call windshield surveys to verify that the properties that are on your records are actually there, or current anyway. And then we have a whole lot of other disciplines that'll be involved in this effort. We have engineering, real estate folks uh, that'll be working with the state of California to get the uh, rights of entry and so on. Um, Environmental reviews, we have lots of environmental laws in the state of California and federal uh, environmental laws that we'll have to comply with. And cultural resources, we'll be checking records to make sure that whatever we do is not gonna impact any uh, identified cultural uh, sites. Uh, and then lastly, the, the slide I think you may be most interested in is the schedule. And that hasn't changed since our last meeting in October. We're still talking about having a chief's report in uh, December of 2012 which is not that far, it's a couple of years from now. Uh, considering we're at the F3 phase, to get here to the Chief's Report, we have to get to an F6, it's called. So we still have four more steps, or three more steps to go through to get to uh, where you wanna be. Uh, so we're on schedule, we haven't had any slips. I have to tell you that the team we have put together between the Corps of Engineers and the city have been very enthusiastic and at a couple of points, uh, the project manager said, well, you know, you have a couple of glitches in the system, it's gonna take a little bit longer. And uh, to their credit, the team said, no, we're gonna stay on schedule, we're gonna get this done. We, we think we have solutions. So uh, we're very happy with the team and their enthusiasm. And I wanna thank the city and your consultant team for helping us out where possible. And uh, it's always good to tell folks that we're on schedule and we haven't slipped. And with that, I'll entertain any questions you might have. Um, th this will be my last meeting, I'm retiring. I, uh, at the end of this, this month, the 28th, I am now, I have my uh, Army, Department of the Army retiree pin, uh, so I'm leaving. And now that I have the pin, I have no choice, I have to leave. There's, <laughs> there's no going back. 
so I want to thank you very much for your time and effort, Mr. Kristoff. Thank you for your participation, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I think the Corps of Engineers has had a very good relationship with the city of West Sacramento, and we appreciate that. It's a very progressive city, very enthusiastic. We enjoy working with Mr. Bessette and uh, Mr. Panos. Uh, so I, I know this project will be successful, and I know we're going to hit our uh, deadlines uh, in 2012. So with that, I'll uh, entertain any questions you might have. Mr. Kristoff, you want to? Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll start off. Um, what do you, and we really appreciate you coming and explaining to not only us, but explaining to the community, you know, what's really going on with <clears throat> flood protection, because it is, it's a complicated issue. I mean, it's, it's not that you can just snap your fingers and build a levee and everybody's safe. I mean, there's a lot of processes and, and a lot of things that we go through. Um, will the person that is going to be your replacement Will they be doing these quarterly reports also? Absolutely. Okay, great. And my replacement has been chosen. Mm -hmm. uh, my replacement is Ms. Uh, Alicia Kirshner, and she is currently my deputy. Okay. So there will be a consistency there. Uh, she's not somebody coming in from, you know, Charleston, North mm -hmm. Carolina or somewhere. She's here. Uh, Mr. Muha, who is our lead planner, will remain on the project. So, yes, she will be coming every quarter and okay. updating you as well. Super. Okay, thank you. Questions? Well, I, I get what well, I can ask. I know you probably some, have some it. of the stuff that don't be courteous. Know, lead. It, it's like, um, is there anything that we can do as a community and as a council to speed up the GRR process? I, I think there are two things, and I think you're both you're doing them both right now. One is uh, working with your consultant team, Mr. Nagy and HDR. Uh, they are part of our team meetings, and if there's something that the community could provide, whether it's uh, real estate data or it's uh, information from the assessor's office and so on, uh, the, I, the community has been more than willing to do that, and that's very helpful. Whatever data you have, you may also have some engineering data mm -hmm. that's available mm -hmm. to us. It saves us the time as long as it's current and it's un, uh, has been accomplished under what we would call uh, standard engineering practices, you know, and so on, which I'm sure it was. Uh, we can use that data, so it saves a little bit of time and a little bit of money. Uh, it's what we call in-kind services. You can do that, and you'll get credit for that, for whatever you supply to us. The other thing is the trip back to Washington. Uh, that's really important to keep that kind of visibility at the federal level, uh, to let Mr. Thompson and Mrs. Matsui know that you're moving along. And, and believe me, that's what they want to see. They want to see progress. They don't want to see every year. We're going back next week to Washington. That's our week in Washington. To, uh, to brief our congressional delegations. We go to 31 different offices in four days and kind of tell them where we are on all their projects in California and eight states that we cover. Um, and they do appreciate the fact when a community comes in and says, mm -hmm. we're working on our levees in West Sacramento, and then the federal government comes in and says, yes, we're partnering with the city of West Sacramento, that means a lot to them. They expect bureaucrats like me to be in there with my hand out looking for money. Uh, but they really, uh, take it seriously and it's a big impact when the community comes in and said these are my constituents that want this project. So what you do is very valuable. It's behind the scenes and often people don't even know that it occurs. But it's very important to us because uh, we get questions. Your visit will generate some questions. I was talking to Mr. Panos and he met with folks at the core as you did. And we get a, a little briefing from them and they said West Sacramento was here and here's the questions they asked and here's what they wanted to talk about. What can you tell me about it? So they do pay attention. So thank you for that. Thank you. All right, thanks. thanks so much. We would love to be at your retirement party with an F4. No, <laughs> I'd be happy with the F3 right now. Oh, okay. So I'll take the F3 and a half. We won't skip. F3 and a half. Can I get you on that one? We can negotiate that. Okay. Gotcha. Okay. All right. Thanks and congratulations. Thank All right, then that brings us to our consent agenda, which is items uh, four through nine. Are there any items any member of the council wishes to remove or item for question, question or comment? Six. Well, he's had six. So you'll, you'll pile on that one? I'll okay. pile on his. Hey, me too, okay. All right, uh, then item five is consideration of resolution, and we have a request for public comment on seven as well. Okay, consideration of development, I'm sorry, consideration of resolution 10-11, authorizing an application for statewide park program grant funds for Sycamore Park. Mr. Villegas. Mr. Laura, I, I don't know if you, you yeah, the, 
yeah, I'm sure if you, you're able to answer this. The, the $4 million request for state funds for the Sycamore Park, does that include any work on the Sycamore pedestrian bicycle pathway that we had originally talked about? I know it was at least penciled in the pedestrian bicycle master plan, and I know that that's kind of a key, key corridor, kind of running north and south, starting to connect all the neighborhoods. Just curious. Uh, it's a big request, and I just wondered if that was included as part of that. Proposal. Sure, I can I can partially answer, then refer to my partner on this, Dave Schbach. Um, we are doing the sidewalk on Sycamore, um, and now for the park part, let me go ahead and go to Dave. Good evening. The park location is on that alignment, <clears throat> so it's it's sort of the wide spot. Uh, but the the project that's going to be proposed for the Prop 84 grant would not go north of West Capitol or, or south of the freeway. So it's, it does not include any of the, the, the narrower trail corridor itself, but it, it would include a sidewalk, as Aaron mentioned, as well as uh, th through trails in the, okay. on the park site. Is there, this is a little bit off topic, but are there plans for funding sources to begin to create that pathway that we've identified as sort of a corridor along the sycamore drain there? Not at this time. Not yet. <clears throat> okay. All right. So they, th this project's not on the park's master plan, right? Or according to the staff report? The, the corridor is in the park master plan. It's a recreation corridor. The, the definition of a recreation corridor is rather broad, and so it, it one could, without a lot of torture, stretch it to include a neighborhood park. But this is a special opportunity for the city to pursue. Okay, gotcha. Okay, thank you. Item six is consideration of second reading and adoption of ordinance 10-4, approving a development agreement between the city and Smart Growth Investors 2 LLC. Uh, members of the council want to take public comment first on this yeah. item. All right, so we have one request to speak on this item. It's by Ben Davis, Jr. again for the opportunity to address you. I'm Ben Davis, Jr. Um, I want to introduce my interest in this a little before I sp specify what it is on this project. Um, from 1981 till, 19 till the formation of the city, basically, or at least until the petitions were cir circulated to form the city, um, I went to every major land use decision before the Board of Supervisors and the Planning Commission of this county and basically tried to forestall any projects that they were going through until the formation of the city. I wanted local control of what was going on here, and I was hoping local control would help reduce the gross Im impacts of all the projects that were planned at this time. Particularly, there was one called the Lighthouse Marina Project that was going to eat up the entire riverbank, um, largely the riverbank I grew up on by my house, which to this day has been to some degree preserved. Um, if all the plans that were planned by the Board of Supervisors at that time went through, it would have about tripled the population in East Jolo. In fact, when you first approved a general plan for the city, you, I mean the city council at that time, first approved a general plan for, East, um, for West Sacramento, all the projects considered together would about, again, triple the population in this area. I thought that was too much. It's basically largely come to pass already. It makes me very sensitive to growth inducing impacts of projects and that's what I expressed concern about as far as this project goes, and item number seven, which I'll throw into this rather than go through another three-minute presentation. I think the incremental effects of all of the projects that have been considered beyond the original general plan that have growth induction in them is considerable. Uh, what they refer to in case law as the pro past, present, and pro probable or possible future projects have not been considered cumulatively in the actions of many projects, including this one that you're considering tonight, including number seven, which seems related to this, and even number 10, which you have um, later, although I haven't studied that as thoroughly. I think that the growth-inducing impacts of this project and the other projects that are associated with it in one way or another are beyond the environmental documents that you're using to um, sustain these projects, and that they should be all of them stopped or denied until you have a chance to consider all the environmental impacts of growth induction in East Jolo beyond the original general plan together as one project. Um, that being said, I'd also like to say that a lot of the projects, in fact, this council has come up with, I appreciate. 
together, the growth induction is a concern of mine. But the uh, transportation projects, some of the growth, some of the stores that have come in and stuff, I do appreciate. So I don't want to throw out the baby with the bathwater, so to speak, still on this project in particular. And, and any that come along with this, I want to cover them all as a blanket thing, saying that I think you should consider them all together, not piecemeal. Thank you very much. Right. Mr. Davis. Oh, and I will not need to speak on number seven. I'm considering I would say together. the same thing. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Johannesson. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to comment the, um, we had a, a lengthy discussion about the development agreement at the last council meeting. and. Um, you know, it was a fairly heated discussion about the, um, you know, exactly what was being agreed to here. But I think what was lost, and I just wanted to express my appreciation for uh, the staff who had spent so much time on this. This was a, a really different type of development agreement in a new part of town. We've tried a lot of different things, and, and the staff, particularly um, Les Bowman and Katie Jacobson and um, Charlene Hamilton, you all. Um, I mean, I really appreciate the above and over uh, work that you did to bring that together. Um, there was a lot of things in that agreement that we've never tried before. Uh, what we were trying to do is create a project in there that was economically viable and also that would protect the city's interest. And we had a lot of issues, um, you know, working a great partnership with the developers. You spent a lot, a lot of time on that. And I just wanted to express my appreciation uh, because we have a product now that really um, reflects the efforts you put in. <clears throat> Mr. Christoph. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> well, I too would like to thank Katie and, and, and Les and, and, and Toby and, and all of the staff that had worked on this. Um, um, I'm going to support this this evening, and I was one of the people that was a little bit critical of it. And I guess one of the reasons that I was critical of it was because if the policies that are in this particular document were in the very first policies when we, when we started the redevelopment agency, we would never be at where we are today because we would have never generated the funds to uh, purchase the rail, to uh, do warehouser. Uh, same thing goes for um, uh, the cement plant over there. And, and we wouldn't have been able to do those because all of the monies generated by that, by the project is gonna go back into the project. And there's been some negotiations taking place and, and um, for me, this project is as important a project as the rail yards is to Sacramento. This is going to be a huge project, folks. This is, this is a big thing. Um, and so, I mean, I think we put together a, a development agreement that will work. Um, and, you know, I'd like to make sure that I send a message to staff that, that says, you know, 100% of all the increment being rolled right back into the same project again. And it is something I really want to take a look at. Um, so, uh, but at the same time, um, this is a project that is going to um, set West Sacramento apart. It, this is a big, this, as I said earlier, this is a big deal. And so I'm very appreciative of what staff has done, worked it all out. Uh, the development community, uh, Mark and his whole team have been, and Danny and, and all the rest of them have, have, uh, have been really good. They're bringing in different ideas that, uh, um, uh, they're just not cookie cutter. They're, they're, they're out there and, and, <clears throat> they've, they've gotten ideas from Europe and back east and, and everywhere. And it's, it, it's going to be, uh, I, I, I think, a pretty nice project. And I think it's going to be something that the city of West Sacramento is going to be very, very happy with. Thank you. Mayor Tempe Agus. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, I would echo exactly what my, uh, my colleagues have said. I, I want to thank staff. They did a wonderful job. This is a, a very complicated, uh, 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 time-consuming, resource-consuming development agreement I think it does set us now down the path for some wonderful things along our waterfront in fact I think the day after or if even in fact not, maybe even the day of the, the vote uh, last week you could already see uh, work in progress with the roads closed on the waterfront and uh, infrastructure construction happening already so uh, things are moving along 
but I, I, I know that it was a very complicated project. I know it took a tremendous amount of time uh, during the holidays. I know we squeeze staff to put together things that ordinarily don't happen uh, during the holidays when we're asking folks to uh, uh, furlough, and, uh, but, but they managed to get put together what I think is, a, is an amazing project, a good, good product for us, and I'm, I'm looking forward to uh, seeing it uh, roll forward. So thank you very much. All right, let me, I, I want to agree, particularly with Mr. Christoph's comments, um, with everyone's, but particularly Mr. Christoph, I'm going to support it um, despite some of the concerns that I've raised about it, but I also um, would not advise placing this future development agreements in the Bridge District if they look exactly like this with respect to the redevelopment fund on the consent calendar, because a vote for this item tonight is not a statement that, this, that the mechanism at this level is, is something that I could support in the future. So I'm saying I can't, but it's, it's, this, is, this is about this project, the, um, where we are with respect to this project, the quality of this project, where, what this project has done to make the Bridge District possible. But for me, it's not precedential, even within the Bridge District, much less, much less redevelopment agency-wide for exactly the reasons that Mr. Christoph has said. If we, if we wind the tape back and applied this to all of our prior development agreements, we couldn't do this project, we couldn't do WESCAP. All, of, all the projects that we've undertaken that we're so proud of would have been impossible. So uh, we can't straightjacket ourselves or future councils without giving it some serious consideration at each step of the way. Uh, all right, that brings us then to the consent agenda. Those are the only items. Is there a motion? Move, move by. No, uh, Ms. Uh, oh, okay. Okay, so moved by Mr. Mr. Beers and seconded by Mr. Johannesson. The consent agenda be adopted. Do we have, we didn't have any staff modifications, right, or? No, no okay. Then all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed, turning on that motion carries. Item 10 is continuation of a public hearing and approval of resolution 10-7, intent to abandon public right of way along Tower Bridge Gateway. The city manager is requesting that the council continue the public hearing on item 10 to mark, without comment to March 3rd, 2010. Without objection, that will be the order. Item 11 is public hearing on draft ordinance 10-2, amending the municipal code and regulation of medical marijuana dispensaries. Good evening. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of the City Council. At the January 13th meeting on the City Council, extended the moratorium on medical marijuana dispensaries until February 2011. The Council also continued the public hearing on Ordinance 10-2, regulating medical marijuana dispensaries until tonight. Now, that continuation was tempered by a reluctance to adopt the ordinance based on testimony by advocates that they might likely challenge certain provisions of the ordinance and also the continuing ever-changing case law regarding medical marijuana regulation. Both at the January 13th public hearing and the December 17th workshop before the council, the council provided direction at what changes they would like to see in a medical marijuana dispensary ordinance. Uh, the revised draft ordinance before you tonight proposes several changes from what the council saw in December. It was distributed to the medical marijuana stakeholders uh, on Monday, and I'd like to just very briefly review some of the most significant changes. Regarding residency, uh, residency has now been expanded to include residents of Yolo County as well as citizens of West Sacramento. On the competitive process, a new competitive review of applications based on how well those applications address three specific criteria has been added. Now, this is in addition to the pre-selection criteria already in place to assure that all applicants at a minimum meet certain thresholds that are stated in the ordinance. With regard to zoning, at prior workshops and hearings on the ordinance, there was considerable discussion about what zones dispensary should be allowed in. Uh, the current ordinance limits them to C2, but however, in view of the council's comments, we believe that expanding where dispensaries are allowed to mixed commercial industrial zones and light industrial zones would provide more opportunities with still adequate safeguards in place. Should the council wish additional discussion of where these zones are, staff are prepared to discuss it tonight or provide maps at a later date. Uh, there was also discussion at the last two meetings regarding a poison pill provision. A poison pill provision has been added that provides if the ordinance is repealed or no longer in effect, medical marijuana dispensaries would no longer be permitted in the city. Uh, 
Additionally, in regard to cost recovery, a provision to recover some of all of the costs, uh, which are now are above $40,000, have been added to the draft. Mm -hmm. Medical marijuana dispensary, the term has been redefined to be a cooperative or collective more than three persons. In addition, several minor miscellaneous changes have been made. Tonight, staff are recommending that the council open the public hearing, take public comments on the revised ordinance, but in view of the reasons stated earlier, continue the public hearing to a date and certain, but not later than November of this year. Uh, in addition tonight, uh, Mona Ibrahimi with uh, Chronic Who and Dave Delaney, both who participated uh, with me in drafting the ordinance, are here tonight to answer any questions. So with that, Council, I'd be happy to answer questions or defer until after Hi, Mr. Sure. Mr. Hannison. Yeah, Steve, um, have you had a chance to review the LA ordinance yet? No, I have not. I've just read the articles in the paper, but I've not gone into great depth on it. I'm familiar with the basic form of regulation that it does, but not any of the specifics. Okay, yeah, I would, I would um, want to see how that compares to what we have here. I think we mentioned at the last meeting, uh, in light of the um, you know potential pursuit to look at a, a larger organization that could take the heat of a lawsuit and maybe have something that's a little more solid that still meets the needs of the patients, that it might be an idea to get a copy of the LA ordinance and just uh, maybe compare and contrast. We have, however, reviewed the cities of West Hollywood and Malibu, which are also two incorporated cities in Los Angeles County with regard to their ordinance on medical marijuana dispensaries. All right, thanks. Okay, other questions for staff or the city attorney at this time? Mr. Christoph? Steve, why was the November date chosen rather than January? Well, November was chosen for a couple reasons, uh, Councilman Christoph. Number one, in November, there will most likely be an issue on the ballot regarding legalization of marijuana. Mm -hmm. In addition, November is probably the maximum time, uh, should the council wish to revisit this issue, that we can take the issue of medical marijuana and put it in a form to have it adopted before February 21st. Because if we defer okay. and don't make a decision, then medical marijuana dispensaries become a conditional use in any zone in the city. Okay. All right. Okay. Thank you. We do have a few requests to speak under item 11. So uh, first invite Nathan Sands, who will be followed by Jared Squires. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, Mayor, Council Members. Um, I, I first, I'm Nathan Sands, local resident and medical marijuana patient and advocate. And I'd like to say that I, uh, I appreciate uh, that this ordinance has taken into account a lot of the um, concerns that we've raised. A lot of these were very important, and, and um, I was uh, pleased to see so many changes. And I, I still think that we have the potential to, to turn this into <clears throat> a workable ordinance and uh, that, that will not attract litigation, and I think that's the goal for everyone. And um, I'd just like to go over then a few of the points where um, I, I'd still like to see some changes. And um, the first two are, are really simple. First of all, it, uh, the ordinance calls on a, a dispensary to be a registered primary caregiver for all of their patients. The courts have ruled again and again that they just can't use the caregiver defense. A, a dispensary isn't a caregiver, and um, it's actually uh, laid out very clearly on the attorney general guidelines. I, I've referenced those a lot, but if you look at page eight, it, it says very clearly that they can't be. Um, and so that's more of a clerical point, so I, I hope I can move on and, and that that would be considered for the future. Um, next, I, I do support the addition of, of two additional zones, uh, potentially to the ordinance. Um, I think this would really help a lot. and. Um, kind of get the dispensaries away from the In-N-Out Burger and so on. Um, uh, moving along, uh, more important issue, I, the residency and the ID card issue, um, th this council stated that you don't want to be on the forefront, cutting edge, trailblazing, and, and those two issues really put you there. there I haven't seen those in other ordinances. They, they might be in a couple, but um, it's not it's not common. And, and to answer your question about the Los Angeles ordinance, I have looked at it, and it does not include ID card requirements or residency requirements. It does include a limit on the number of dispensaries. It's, I think, 80 or something. It's, it's quite large. But um, I, I think we would be better off uh, taking those out of the ordinance. And, and I think at that point, we, with these changes, we'd have a pretty good, solid ordinance that would give the city a lot of control. And, and I think we've misunderstood you, each other on the ID card issue, especially. Um, 
all the dispensaries in the state are currently using a model where they, they have to verify your identification and call your doctor and, and make sure you're the person who was given the recommendation. And it's, it's rock solid. Um, I, the, the ID card uh, actually is missing a lot of information that the, the dispensary would need. And, and so it really doesn't add any security. It just adds a lot of cost. And, and I'd be curious to know what, what this council thinks is added by the ID card issue. And, and, and same with the residency. Um, I, do you think we're going to be flooded with people from Rio Vista or, or Dixon or something? It's it's positioned between Sacramento and the Bay. We, there's really not a huge risk that we're going to have a ton of people pouring into West Sacramento's dispensaries. Um, and lastly, I'd like to say that there is some urgency here because it, it would be very easy as f for us to end up like Los Angeles, where there's a, the moratorium was was defied, it was overturned. Some people are legally open, some are not, and there's a huge cleanup process that's going to have to happen now. And I, I just don't want to see us that way. Thank you. Uh, Mayor Pro Viegas for a question. Yeah, just, just a question. I, I, um, just to follow up maybe on your last point, I think part of the, and I, mean, I won't speak for the whole council, but I'll speak for myself, part of the conversation the last time, I think, in, 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 in insisting that we have an identification card as part of the ordinance was, I think, to, and at least from, in my mind, legitimize the request, essentially so that you don't have people who simply want to get high to get high showing up and buying pot. You said that that the card is an unnecessary cost, and that in fact there's a better system, which is a verification by the telephone to call the doctor to in fact verify that this person is. So, help me understand. So, so in your opinion, you're saying that that's a better way to get to what, at least in my mind, I'm trying to get to, which is to legitimize the operation. I mean, the fact is, you're going to always have folks that just simply want to get high, that want to get their pot, so they're going to try to buy it, and some dispensaries or co-ops are going to sell it to them. Right, and the, the so, Los Angeles so, ordinance has oversight of the whole process that I've discussed. They, so they isn't that, I mean, I, I don't want to, LA has, over, see, I, I don't want us to be in the business of having to regulate that, so I'm just not certain, at least I don't understand how the solution that you've recommended gets to what I'm, what, we're, what I think we're trying to get to, which is to, le to force the legitimation, the, you know, the legitimizing the operation in some fashion, but I don't want to also be patrolling the thing 24 hours a day to say, did you call, did you verify the call, how do we know it was good, I mean, I just, so I don't know how that I, does it. I, I would think like most businesses, uh, record checks, especially at the beginning, but periodically to make sure that, that uh, the business is doing what they're allowed to do. Every single uh, gram of medicine that goes out of there is, is documented as to who it goes for and taxes are paid. Uh, that, that, uh, the Los Angeles ordinance does do this and, and mm -hmm. um, I, I guess I don't see how the ID card changes anything. If we get the ID card and then you want to see all of our ID cards, then you're back in the business of, of 24 hour oversight. Yeah, I don't know how it does either. I just, I'm not sure I understand what the best way to to accomplish our goal, which is to make sure that we are forcing the issue of, of making a legitimate operation and not just, you know, selling to whoever, whomever, whenever. So. Right. Well, I think if you have full authority to inspect the books and inspect, require that every single transaction is documented and that every single patient is verified, um, which we fully support, um, it, and the Los Angeles ordinance includes, then. Mm -hmm. um, I don't see how the ID card changes anything. I, I think the, and, and legally under the law, it's, it's Proposition 215 says that it's your recommendation from your doctor that makes you legitimate, that the ID card was really just meant to stop police harassment. Okay. Right. Thank you. Thank you. No, I'm gonna look. Oh, thank, thank you, Mr. Lance. Uh, Jared Squires, we followed by Lynette Davies. Yes, good evening, Mr. Mayor, honorable council members council members um, and staff. Um, uh, the previous speaker hit on all the sensitive issues, that is for sure. My name is Jared Squires, I'm a Yolo County resident, I'm also a mar medical marijuana advocate. Um, Mr. Johannesson, just to let you know, the LA ordinance <laughs> is considered a bit of a mess, and in fact, from what I understand, it will never go into effect in its current form. It's already back in amendment committee, I believe they refer to it as. Um, it was a knee-jerk reaction to a mess of a situation in Los Angeles. And um, not to tell you um, what should be important, but I don't think it's one of the better uh, ordinances. I think Mr. Rakala and Mr. Ross have done a great job reviewing the uh, various uh, ordinances that would be more 
applicable to West Sacramento, I think they've come up with an outstanding ordinance. There are the issues that my uh, prior speaker mentioned. And regarding the, um, the ID cards, it's a, it's a state voluntary program. Um, the ID cards. It's not mandatory, so you're getting into these areas where you're mandating things that are not required under the law, and those are the rubs, you know, where you're going to have potential problems. What my colleague was saying is you do have a place, a system in place, which is if you have a doctor-issued recommendation, and most doctors are now going towards a 24-7 verification where an officer or anyone in public service wants to verify the, the validity of the recommendation, they can call up and get that answer 24-7. So it's sort of, if that works well, is the 215 card absolutely necessary? It probably gives a little bit greater um, comfort and security to law enforcement if they see the 215 card. But as a practical matter, you only have one person in your locality issuing uh, uh, 215 cards, and it takes a month wait right now. So you can imagine if you adopt an ordinance, you're going to be waiting a lot longer to get the 215 card unless you can add some more staff there um, processing those cards. But I think all of the comments were right on. Um, the additional selective criteria that Mr. Ricala and Mr. Ross came up with is very unique. I've never seen that in any ordinance, and I've read about 60 of them in the in the in the state of California and what they have done is is really put a lot of thought into coming up with a workable ordinance where you can uh, essentially get extra extra points in your application for being good corporate citizens for being good citizens in the community I think that's a very unique uh, uh, way that they've done it very unique provision and so I want to give um, Mr. Ross and Mr. Ricala and their um, Ricala um, the their respective staffs a lot of credit um, that's all. Thank you very much. All right, thank you, Mr. Squires. Uh, and Lynette Davies. Hello, I'm Lynette Davies, Sacramento, and I'll make it quick this time. We'll make it so wordy today. The residence restriction, um, of course, from Yolo County is definitely better than what it had been, but I, I still wouldn't favor it for a couple of reasons, but we'll get back to that one. I love the idea that you added two more zones. And then my only issue was on your, where you described on page three of your ordinance of 10 and E, a medical marijuana dispensary means any facility or location where medical marijuana is made available to and or distributed by a person or a cooperative collective or more than three persons. Three persons can be pretty restrictive. I would actually reword that to, because you have people that are growing within their own homes that legally can. <coughs> I would say that should probably be reworded to say they should qualify under the state of California tax code for a seller's permit. If you qualify under the California state, uh, state code for a seller's permit, then you are obviously more of a retail division and you sh that would take care of any patient's concerns as far as if they were um, growing within their own homes. And the reason that I would pr uh, was against basically low, uh, reducing the amount of people that can come to a dispensing and collective is because they only work within their membership. So your membership is where your product actually comes forward. I would not want to see people having to grow in Yolo County or in West Sacramento simply to keep their dispensing collectives going, where now they have a broad, wide area up into the foothills all the way down that are members of the collective, but they may come maybe once a year. That's just the way it works. They keep the rest of your uh, membership supplied with medication, and they also keep your costs down. The minute you have your costs, when you start limiting your supply, you also bring up your cost. So that was one of my concerns. On the ID card, I do have a copy of an ID card. I have my ID card if you'd like to see it. It does not have my name on it. It does not have my address on it. It does say I, a picture of me, and it says that my medical marijuana recommendation is good until April 9th of 2010, when in reality it expired in January. So I don't think it's a good idea to have the ID card as something that you should depend on. And the other issue on, a deep, on the ID card is that you are forcing the citizens or the patients that use medical marijuana to put their names down on a state database. And that really is a civil rights issue where they don't have to be on a state database because they are a patient of medical marijuana. And I don't think that should be forced on them. And the other last thing I'm just going to bring up real quick since I've got 18 seconds is um, an article, I don't know if you got to see, from the LAPD chief specifically stating that crime goes down when you have medical marijuana facilities in your area. He did his own study, 
and found that um, out of, in Los Angeles, which is of course a huge city, there were 71 robberies at more than 350 banks, and there were 47 robberies at over 800 dispensaries. Okay, that's all. All right, thank you, Ms. Davies. Thank you. All right, those are all the comments on item 11. So, Mr. Ricola, do you have any further comments based on uh, Not testimony? at this time, Mr. Mayor. Mayor. All right, then we'll turn to the council for any further questions or discussion. Or for a motion. I would motion that we continue the public hearing to a date uncertain, but no later than November uh, 2010. Second. Okay, seeing no further discussion then, uh, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed? Hearing none, that motion carries. Um, and I know I, uh, you know, there are several of us that are disappointed that this is the road that we've ended up at, but I, I mean, the issues, the two outstanding issues have been the two critical issues raised by the council from the first day. And there's just, there's, there does not appear to be, uh, I mean, we've, we've moved on every single other element of the, of the, uh, of the uh, um, complaints and congestion. Uh, sir, I don't want to have to have you removed since you're leaving anyway. <laughs> um, but those issues are fundamental. Um, and, it, and given that, and given that they are so fundamental for the advocates for a wide variety of reasons, uh, it doesn't seem that it's in anyone's interest other than patients who um, are caught in the crossfire to, uh, to be able to deal with this. And I, and I know that several of us are truly sorry about that, that, that you know, we know plenty of people in our community with MS or other neuropathic conditions and, and, and other serious pain issues that are struggling as re and uh, having to go to Sacramento or do other things, uh, uh, you know, use illegal dispensaries. But we also know there are problems, um, you know, and, and I've uh, you know, personally been solicited by enough unscrupulous doctors and dispensary clinics and others to know that we can't simply say, you know, here, you know, open up and, and uh, you know, we'll come back to it later and see how it's going. We have to, we have an obligation to the community to make sure we're getting it right at the front end too. So in balancing that, it, it, it does appear that our best option is to wait until whether the ballot initiative is done or additional court cases, or I know that there was today's research reports out of San Diego on the efficacy of you know confirming both the efficacy of, of medical marijuana, but also confirming the efficacy of vaporized forms of medical marijuana that don't require smoking, and which then present a different set of potential opportunities for dispensaries that may not have some of the same implications that the council and community members might be concerned about. So the the medical legal um, environment is is rapidly changing, and I and I hope we will at some point be able to assert leadership again. But it just at this point it doesn't it, that doesn't appear to be a path that's open to us. So I want to thank the folks who participated and spent along with our staff and us, who have spent a lot of resources uh, on this issue, although it's disappointing we're not able to get to conclusion. I, and I think, you know, everyone was trying to do uh, what was best for the patients, and we just can't get there. So item 12 is uh, consideration of resolution 10-14, approving interim traffic and park impact fees. Ms. Espen? I thought you wanted to hold this over. I want to hold over action, at least. And I'm okay. happy to, yeah. Any news here on uh, medical marijuana? Danny was here. He's leaving medical marijuana. Do you think there are that many druggies? Just kidding. Yes. Thank you, Mayor, members of the council. Um, the item before you this evening pertains to the results of the interim traffic and park impact fee study. This study was jointly commissioned by the city of West Sacramento and the West Sacramento Chamber of Commerce. Um, the study reflects the ongoing collaboration be between the chamber and the city regarding the overall review of the city's impact fee programs. The study does recommend a set of interim traffic and park impact fees for the council's consideration this evening. Just one housekeeping item, there is a memorandum before you tonight. It does two things. Um, one, it replaces page four of six of the exhibit attached to the resolution and um, ensures that you see the red line track changes for the second page of the traffic fees. And the other is that it includes the um, letter of support provided by the Chamber of Commerce. In terms of background, the city and the chamber have been reviewing the city's impact fee programs since 2007. Your staff report itemizes the actions that the council has taken over the last two years in response to the chamber's um, review of our fee programs. The council did make adjustments, including a reduction in the water connection fee, as well as other items. 
During the summer of 2009, the chamber did approach the staff requesting an additional study be conducted and that this study look at sort of the overall infrastructure burden, particularly related to the current recession that we find ourselves in. Um, in thinking through this additional study, there are several sort of um, issues and factors at play. Clearly, the severity of the recession um, has really impacted the ability to develop um, you know, real estate product. However, there really are sort of no adjustments the city's impact fee programs could make to entirely compensate for the weakened market conditions. Having said that, it's important that the city remain competitive um, in its fee programs relative to other jurisdictions um, and that the infrastructure burden here in West Sacramento is, is not overly cost prohibitive. Um, it was also important as we thought about this additional study to maintain the sort of the integrity of our existing um, infrastructure master plans to ensure that development would um, occur according to our planning goals and objectives. So within that context, we sort of thought about an approach to an interim fee study. The fact that it be interim was important so that um, it would be in place for a, a certain shortened period of time that would reflect the time period under which we would um, hopefully come out of the current recession. Um, parks and traffic fees were identified as the key fees to focus on, and those are be that's because those fees represent the largest infrastructure burden within the city. So, you know, effectively using our time and, and resources on those two was, was seen as the, the best approach. Um, and then with regards to the methodology, what, what the interim fee study tried to do was to look at how facilities um, have actually been financed or are planned to be financed as compared to how we assume they would be financed when we did the original Nexus studies in the 2005 time period. Um, this methodology yields a result that's sort of not arbitrary but based on the uh, reduced costs associated with funding facilities differently than we had originally planned. The Harbor Boulevard interchange is, the, is a prime example. Uh, the current fee program assigns $26.5 million of those costs to the fees. However, we have been successful in receiving state funding and we are only requiring it to participate of about $4.6 million in impact fee funds. So what the interim fee study does is assign a reduced amount of cost to the fee program and then proportionally adjust the impact fees um, similar to that, that reduction. The results of the study are a 22% 22 22 reduction in the traffic fees and a 15 to 20% reduction in the park fee, depending on the category. There are other items in the interim fee study related to the ability to calculate a specialty park fee ca calculation for industrial uses, um, the ability to calculate specialty fee calculations for all the impact fees in the event that a land use comes in that's different from the, the oversimplified categories that we have in our fee programs. Um, there is a provision to allow for us to substitute um, trails on the levy for existing park facilities, and there is a, a provision to replace the current index for inflationary adjustments on the traffic fee um, with the engineering news record. Those items are outlined in your staff report. Um, I'm, I'm comfortable discussing them in more detail at, at the council's direction. Again, I just want to reiterate that you did receive a letter of support for these modifications from the chamber. Um, and you know, tonight the council does have some options. Um, there is a recommended action before you, which is to accept the interim fee study and to approve the resolution that would amend the book of fees um, to include the, new, the revised fee amounts. But um, this is the first time the council has seen the study and to the extent the council is interested in additional information, um, or needs additional time, staff can bring this item back at a later date at, at the council's direction. With regards to changing the overall amount of the recommendations in the, in the fee study, the council could choose to reduce the fees um, at a, a larger reduction or a, a smaller reduction, but the council could not choose to increase the fees at this time. We'd have to do a whole new nexus study for that, for that to be done. Um, that essentially concludes my, my formal comments. Um, Charlene Hamilton and Maureen Pasco are also here with me. They've, they've been involved in the study and um, available for questions. So, so Shannon, just methodologically, so there are three ways that you would have a fee 
this is a cost-based study. It's not, we didn't say GR fees are too high or they're more than Rancho Cordova because they're a lot less. We said we want our fees, we think costs could be lower, go look at that so if there's less cost then we would lower fees. And there's three ways that fees could go, that cost could go down. Actual, the cost of construction and stuff like that could be less than we had originally forecast in the, in the infrastructure master plans. We could get other funding sources that we had not anticipated in those original funding master plans, or we could cut um, projects out or scale them back in some way, right? The, those are the three ways. And what you're saying is, we, did, we, did we do the first two and not the third? We didn't, we didn't take any projects out. We're not, we're not, we didn't change our vision for the community with respect right. to infrastructure in this interim report, but we did pursue the other two or just the outside funding one. Um, it was predominantly the second one, and then to some extent the third. Um, we did not take any facilities out, but for two of the interchanges, we said that we could defer the improvements until a later date on one of them, and then um, said that we could, um, we, we may not need the amount of funding that we thought we needed for the other one. Those were the two that would be considered more of a deferral. The other one was all the other adjustments relate to the, uh, the um, ability to receive other funding. And so if, um, so when we get a grant from the state or the federal government, which we've been ex extraordinarily successful in, does it, are, are you, are we using it in, the, in this methodology to fully offset fees or are, because we're, we have our own contribution to those infrastructure master plans, either through user fees, through redevelopment, through our own capital improvement program as well. Do, do we, do we share the benefits of, of uh, those external monies across the board, or are we just applying them to reduce developer fees? In this case, it was really just taking a look at the amount of um, funding from the fee program that was assumed in the original study, and then comparing that to actually how much fee money we're going to use, or we have used, and then making this the straight calculation. Um, in some cases, you know, the grant money did also offset city city funds as well, but if it, if it resulted in an outcome such that there was less fee revenue used, then we made that subtraction. Okay, so we're, and we're only looking backwards. We're not, we, we weren't projecting more money that we have not actually secured for projects into the future. That, in that's that. correct. I, I would just caveat that by saying there are certain assumptions related to the Bridge District financing plan and the CFD formation that uh -huh. haven't officially been formed, but, but we've assumed that that does happen. Okay, and I mean, are, are, do all the, do the infrastructure, do these two traffic uh, infrastructure plans have unfunded components in, in the master plans? I mean, usually when we see capital improvement budget, it has, this is how we're funding year one, this is how you're funding year two, and year three we have no idea where the money's coming from. Okay. Is, that, is that the case with this? Are we, I mean, should, I mean, and, and the idea being, we hope we will get, but, you know, in year three by then, we hope we will have gotten some of these external grants to fill in those gaps. Right. And so I'm, that, so I'm curious how this relates to, are we, are we eating up our own seed corn? I guess the only way I can answer that question is to say that in the fee studies that were done in the 2005 time period, there was clearly an amount of funding that was required to come from other sources, either city revenue or grants. There's still an amount that has to come from that source. Um, with regards to our, our CIP, you know, we have gone through the process of um, pulling back on that given our revenue realities. Um, and so, you know, the overall amount of projects that we that were planning to construct are less than what we had originally thought. But we, but we still intend to construct those, right? So, so uh, I mean, and we could use the traffic fees that we did not spend on the Harbor Project for one of those many, many, many projects on the CIP that is scheduled but, on, but has, you know, either no fund, no identified funding source or a big funding gap. Correct. Right, but in, so that's why I'm asking about what's the, what's the, I mean, it does make sense. I mean, it, when, when we go and work hard to get these federal and state yeah. grants, we are trying to re reduce the cost of, of doing business here. But I'm, I'm also make sure that it's, a, it's, that it's equitable and that we, it does, that it, as we go out and do that, because it does, requires a lot of staff time and certainly a lot of our own political capital to get those dollars, that we're also using it to fill the, what we know are gaps in our roads and transit systems and everything else over time. And I'm not sure, I'm not sure that I understand how that's happening yeah, here. Yeah, I, I think, that typically when we would redo our nexus studies, we would pull everything into the mix and we would say, you know, we have additional facilities that we need to fund. Um, we have certain facilities that we no longer need to fund or we fund them differently than we thought we were going to five years ago. We have restrained ourselves from identifying new facilities that we need to build um, during this update. 
So we're not we're not adding more costs into the mix. All right, but like, do we do we have full funding for? I mean, even like some of the what you might think of as backbone infrastructure projects, the full completion of Southport Parkway, the South River Road Bridge, the Broadway Bridge. I mean, we don't have. If I, I mean, if I recall correctly, and correct me if I'm wrong, we don't we don't have those projects with an identified funding source into the future, Mr. Ross? Well, it depends on which project you're talking about, but in fact, there are examples that you've cited where the anticipated source of funding is development um, with direct improvements by the developer as part of a development agreement, but without that development occurring, nothing happens. But we have not substituted impact fees as a mechanism to do that. Um, the other thing that you often see is we show that we have don't have adequate revenue. That's a cash flow issue often in the CIP rather than a question of whether the fees would generate it if we actually <coughs> had the development. And so a lot of times we simply haven't secured the impact fees that once the development occurs we would secure. So I think I think the the correct answer to your basic question is when we have previously contemplated spending impact fees and we reduce the number of impact fees we spend by virtue of getting a grant, that reduced amount of fees is what goes into the calculation. And some of that money went to offset that, some of it went to offset our other contributions. But the, the actual amount of fees that went into the project is what we use to calculate it. And it, and it can't actually just uniformly, it's not completely fungible. You can't um, put a $30 million interchange in a project to be funded by impact fees and then fund it with a grant and then assume that you can take the $30 million and go somewhere else. You have to do a new nexus study to show that there is actually a balance there. Sure. And we haven't done that in this instance. Yeah, and I'm not proposing, you know, going to that extreme either, which mm -hmm. is that, you know, sorry, developers, you don't get any, you don't share in any of the benefit. I'm just, it, 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 it doesn't, it seems like our, our unfunded, tra you know, road fund and traffic fund and, you know, streetcar, we have development money for 10 million of it or whatever, and hopefully a grant, but we still don't know we're going to pay for, you know, a big chunk of the rest of that, that, that we, ha those are out there, and then we say, well, we have enough money to reduce our fees. I just want to, I, I don't want to, right. you know, ac you know, accidentally by an action tonight, you know, severely restrict our ability to deliver the infrastructure that we know is 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 uh, is necessary. So I, that that's, that was my principal concern. Now the other issue is, and, and, and so, in, look, for example, in the British district, we have this backbone, and then I forget what we call what you call the the next level up supplemental. Yeah, the supplemental. So we we sort of have that notion in place that okay, here's our financing plan. We've c sort of cobbled this together for the bridge district. If we're able to get additional resources through whatever means, development takes off more and faster than it, we thought it would, or we get some, you know, some extra money from the state or the feds, then we'll bump up to these other these other infrastructure amenities that we would like to see in the bridge district. We don't really have that concept uh, citywide, and so there. So when you know large grants come in, and we are starting to see you know fairly significant grants come to the city, we don't have a mechanism to say, okay, with that, you know, if for every 10 million that comes in, we're going to spend. Uh, two million dollars to reduce impact fees. We're going to spend two million dollars to fill in gaps. We're going to spend two million dollars to move up to that supplemental level. And, and I'm not suggesting that we can do that in an interim fee study. But I just, I, I, as we're talking about this, I think we need to, you know, be paying some attention to, uh, you know, our, how much we're how much we're constraining our, our, our the ability of this and future councils to be able to deliver that basic infrastructure. Um, okay. Were there further questions for staff at this point? Mr. Beers? Well, <clears throat> so I just want to be, be sure. So um, if, if the city's successful with the streetcar um, grant from the feds, that's $25 million, you wouldn't then turn around and look to try and reduce any participation from existing um, agreements for streetcars, would you? To, to my knowledge, their streetcar is not in any fee program to date. Well, in, in the Bridge District, there's... Uh, it's, there is a financing plan, but it's not an impact fee. Right. Well, so and, and I understand that, but, I, but I'm just trying to make, make correlation. I mean, we have a huge unmet need in the streetcar absolutely. transit system, and so I just want to make sure that as, as we take this action, which isn't exactly the same, but that we aren't going to start a policy whenever we get um, a, an extra amount of money that we immediately look to reduce the fees because we don't have enough to, 
this this just builds a short uh, right. starter line. Exactly. Um, it, this would only affect the actual diversion of impact fees. So it, with respect to the streetcar line, $25 million doesn't give us all that we need to start with, and we and it's not really funded with an impact fee system. Actually, it's I think on your agenda for next year, you're going to be looking at streetcar impact fees, aren't you? <laughs> Where? Oh. Actually, we, we're looking at districts because uh, it has a service area. Okay. And then, okay. Uh, any other questions at this point? Okay, we do have a couple of requests to speak on the item. The first is by uh, John Tallman on behalf of the West Sacramento Chamber of Commerce. Good evening, Mayor Cabal and members of the City Council. Uh, my name is John Tallman. I'm here this evening as the Public Affairs uh, Chair for the West Sacramento Chamber of Commerce. You have a letter from our CEO, Denise Seals, uh, indicating the Chamber's support. Um, I came here this evening, one, to express appreciation to your staff for uh, their efforts over the past few years. This has been a high priority uh, item on the Chamber uh, to address the, the cost of business in the community, development fees being one of those areas that we're focusing on. And we believe that the, the item here that this evening, we encourage your support. But we also view this as a first step in really looking at the infrastructure requirements for the community. Um, and to the mayor's point about identifying the vision for the community and whether we're eroding that, is to look at the general plan process that you're, you're also involved in as a forum in which to really evaluate and get meaningful input from the community as to really what we need. Um, we all have a lot of things we want. Uh, once we get them, can we continue to afford them after the fact to maintain them and keep them at the at the high level of, of quality and maintenance that uh, uh, the community will, will come to expect? So uh, for this evening, we encourage you to adopt or to accept the uh, fee reduction recommendation uh, on an interim basis for parks and traffic, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, Dan Ramos? Good evening, Mayor Cabal and members of the City Council. Dan Ramos, actually River, uh, representing River Point Marketplace here tonight. And just uh, want to reiterate what John was saying. And uh, it's been a, a great effort, great collaborative effort. Many of you have participated in this. And, and uh, I do want to say, you hear me up here a lot saying how great staff was. But in this case, we really was working with Shanna, Char Charlene, and Maureen. And Usually uh, you're not telling the truth. Yeah. What's that? Usually you're not no, telling I'm the truth. No, I'm always because they're always, they're, 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 <laughs> they're very good, they're very professional, and, and I think they, they understood our, we, we actually approached them and said, we, we need some help. And the business community came, the chamber came, and said, we need some help. We, we can't, we're, we're stagnant, we can't get uh, uh, developments. These fees are high, and we're having a hard time getting things going, and that's the case of River Point right there. We've um, uh, kind of hit, hit a wall with retail, and, and uh, we have some building shelves up there. We're trying to attract now the more of the mom pop type tenants, the franchisees that go in and do the restaurants that we've all wanted from the community, stuff like this. And this means a lot to this. This is where, where the deals are made right here. It means you're getting beat up big time. Lowered rents, basically. So, and you've all heard me whine and you know, you had here, but uh, it's, it's really helpful. And, and as you see, we're having some success out there in, in marketing. And that's why I think, you know, we step forward and help fund this study because we think it's going to come back to it. And, and remember, when we do this, you generate property tax, you generate more increment, you create more value in these buildings, and that's, so there is a win from the city right, right on. So sitting out there with an empty shell doesn't do anybody any good. It's a big burden for everybody and can cause a lot of heartache because we have, you know, there's always, there's your taxes are serviced and so we really, really appreciate the effort that would have, and it was, it was very good. So like John said, we've got a lot of work to do. I think we learned a good lesson in this community over the last 20 years here um, as we participate in general plans I think our last one, we, we had you know, great big appetites. We're going to go take on the world here and build the best, you know, of all the parks and things we're ever having, best transportation system, and, and we're going to service all this at level service C and stuff. That costs a lot of money to do. So I think you're going to see the chamber take a really strong, uh, you know, in, interest in the, into the uh, general plan process and our policies in terms of what's our level of service? What's our parks? What do we really need? What's the best bang for a buck? We've got to be smart with infrastructure because we've all have faced these high costs of building these things. So it's just going to be something we're going to work collaboratively on. And hopefully, we come out and then keep this community and build the, the public amenities we want because that's what creates value. We understand that. I think we've had a great effort in the Bridge District. It was very collaborative. You guys helped put that, bring that along tonight. So we appreciate the collaborativeness and we hope we can keep that open. But I do want to really thank Shannon, Charlene, and, and Maureen for. Uh, 
um, all the work they did. They, they put a lot of good time into this, and, and uh, this is very much needed. It really, really helps, especially a lot of us with building shells. We're trying to make those deals. This is what gets us over the top, so we really appreciate it. Thanks again. Thank you, Mr. Ramos. All right. And I know that there are, you know, there are additional questions. I do want to, you know, this was a, an, impor an important initiative that we launched um, to try to be responsive to folks in the development community, but also to make sure that we were up to date and knew that there were uh, changes in the market and in financing that could be taken advantage of. So as we talk about the, the details of it tonight, um, you know, that, that, that which are important. I mean, the general effort I think is, has been very, very critical. And we've seen other communities in the region are just sort of madly rushed. We have to cut our fees. We have to cut our fees. Perhaps not recognizing that there is a global recession happening. We haven't seen, we have not been outcompeted by Woodland Elk Grove, Rancho Cordova, Rose, with these other communities just on the, on the basis of fees. Because it is, uh, the small changes in fees are not major drivers of project viability in a market like this. Um, so that's, we're not doing this because we think we're going to get, um, you know, tons of new development coming in the door next week if, if we were to adopt it tonight. But we are trying to make sure that the costs are fairly allocated and that to the extent that we can, that we have a competitive, a competitive package. But I, I, don't, I don't think, it, you know, anyone from the, if, uh, you know, anybody that would be watching what we're doing, this is not intended to be a, a, a big, a major driver tomorrow of new development. But when the, when the market turns, we want to be in a, in a position to be able to, to exploit that. Um, I do, I mean, I have to say, the, you know, the comments sort of, public comments almost, you know, they get me a little concerned again, because I, I, I'm not prepared by this action. This action for me is not a start of, let's revisit whether we're too ambitious. Uh, you know, maybe, we're, maybe we want to have too much quality and too many amenities. I, that's not what this interim study was to be about, and I'm, I'm definitely not prepared to go there, to, to recalibrate your, your uh, expectations about what your community can be in the worst recession since the Great Depression, maybe worse, is not, is, uh, that's a really poor strategic choice for any community to make. So I, I don't want to do that. Um, that's not, for me, that's not what this is about. And if there are those sorts of things that are reflected in methodology, which I don't see them being there, um, you know, I just want to flag that that's, to me, that's not one of the objectives here, to say, let's, let's be more reason, reason, realistic about what, you know, how high we can shoot for what we want West Sacramento to be. In fact, the reason why we're able to even look at most of these fee reductions is because we have been more successful than we thought in getting everyone else to believe in our vision uh, in state government and in HCD and at DOT and at, you know, everywhere else at SACOG. Um, so, you know, if anything, I think it's an argument for that. We don't want to get in a race to the bottom over who can be, who can have the least aspiration in the region and therefore charge the, the lowest amount of fees. So for, for me, that's an issue. One other just um, processing point that I'd like to raise, and that is, I think in a couple of weeks, we're, we'll have the uh, green building ordinance up. And obviously, one of the challenges that we will be addressing in that ordinance is the economics of, of incentives and that sort of thing. And I would like to, at, you know, put before the council the notion that we, uh, well, for two reasons. One, I don't, I don't think, I, I, I would like more time just on the details of this, you know, what's what's under the hood, um, on the on the projects. But I also think, uh, you know, we will be we will be wanting when that green building ordinance comes forward, the opportunity to have some way to incentivize green buildings without make necessarily having as heavy a regulatory framework as we might have contemplated if this were 2008 or 2007. And so the ability to set differentiated development impact fees based on some of those environmental criteria so that, you know, things like the Bridge District that are going to be, you know, lead across the board might, you know, might, they, they are going to generate fewer impacts and they should have lower fees that will want that option um, at least to be considered. And so for me, it would be more ideal to have this up that same night for final action if, 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 if it's ready at that point rather than doing it tonight and then wishing two weeks from now that we had some flexibility to, to, to provide a little incentive. So all I'm saying is we may come to a point where we say, if these are the right numbers, let's, let's reduce all the fees by 15% and let's leave 7% for you know, incentives for green building or something. I, I haven't thought it through, but I, just, I don't want to, for me personally at least, cast a vote tonight that's going to close the door on, on, uh, on the option of economic incentives through our development impact fees for encouraging green building as opposed to mandating it. So. Mr. Beers. Well, first a question, then a comment. Um, when will this be effective? I mean, not notwithstanding when we vote, what, what's the effect? It, it would be effective the, the day after the uh, approval of the council. Okay. All right. Um, I, I kind of wanted to, to, to also comment um, along the lines of the mayor, um, uh, specifically when we're talking about, I, I think our general plan is the reason we are being successful. And, and I don't think that we aim too high. I think we... We made, uh, I certainly know that, that to the degree I was involved in any of it, we, we tried to balance all of those levels of service, et cetera, et cetera, in our policies. 
And I, I think that it's important that we continue that process, but I, I just want to be sure that, that the process is about quality, always about quality, and not about um, what's the minimum level we can squeak by with. So I, I'd be more than happy to, to engage in conversations about how do we reduce the number of lanes of traffic we need because we can become more efficient um, because we have a, a good bike trail system and we have a transit system and we have other things that can reduce costs and we, we look at it um, globally along those lines, not simply about uh, this fee versus that fee, you know, we should discuss about where do we want to be, what, what's the, the, the vision that we have and what's the, the, you know, what's changed in the last 20 years that we can do a better job as opposed to um, one of the things that I think holds us back is that we always end up at the end of the day looking at charts with numbers and it comes down to how many thousand square feet and what's, what's, the, what's the bottom line it's going to cost me. And, and I, I know from a business perspective, we have to have some certainty and some number that they can grab hold of, but I think we need to open our minds during the, the plan, uh, general plan discussions, and I think it's the perfect place to do it. I just want to put out there that um, it shouldn't be about simply seeing if we can ratchet down, you know, X number of dollars per square, thousand square feet. It should be about how do we get to the product that we want in the most efficient and cost-effective way. So, so I think we can get to the same kinds of place. I just want to be sure the discussion isn't always about uh, this, this particular number. I mean, the numbers have to be what, what it is going to cost us. And, and that was what I was a little disturbed about the discussion. And, and I'm comfortable with what we're, we're doing tonight. It's, it's, I think, a very narrow proposal based on some set of specific circumstances that are, are somewhat unique. Um, but I don't want to see, um, because, because the capital improvement plans that we've seen in the past had huge unfunded liabilities. I mean, I don't think it was just cash flow. I mean, it was cash flow for the first two years, but, but there, there was a lot of uh, dollars that uh, we, we didn't know where they were going to come from. Um, there's plans for them, and there's hopes. But um, so, so I think this is a unique circumstance. I, I can. Um, I can live with uh, the mayor's request to delay it, though I'm not totally sure whether we should or not, just because it delays the benefit that this could could come across. But I would I would uh, I would give on that point. Anyway, I just want to make the point, especially to my friends in the chamber, because I I know that um, you should know that I listen to you all the time. I just don't want to make this the, the, when the, when we made the statement that the general plan might have been too too big. I actually, you know, I would just stand up and disagree on that that point. But how do we get to big is, is I think, a fair discussion. Okay. Mr. <coughs> Johansson? Yeah, I'd like to um, just chime in as well um, and, and thank staff for, again, working um, with the development community to come come up with something that's at least it's the start of uh, looking how we can enter the realm of competitiveness. And it's not just the, the cities in the region, but it's across the river. and. Um, so, um, you know, I, I think um, I'm looking forward to the discussion when we come into the general plan and the level of service, and, and because I think that's really going to um, help us in what our infrastructure needs are going to be, particularly when we consider what type of level of service we need for transit to work, because I think all that will play into um, probably less reliance on more expensive infrastructure. We'll still be able to carry through our vision, but um, you know, if there's not a need because of a transit system, for example, or less reliance on cars, less reliance on parking structures, then those are other ways that we can still fulfill our vision of having, uh, for example, a vibrant riverfront and urban downtown. Um, but we, we can legitimately look at a reduction of fees because of that. So. Um, I think it's a, it's a good start. Um, I'm looking forward to continued conversation about um, anything that we can do to be competitive because I think um, some of the comments were correct that, um, you know, uh, we, we, can, we have our vision of what our infrastructure is going to be, but there's a question when the infrastructure goes in and it's when we have the ability, uh, the ability to uh, pay for it. And a lot of that ability to pay for it is based on attracting development here that will generate taxes and, and, and so forth. 
So it's, it's kind of a, um, a catch-22. We want the infrastructure. We also want the development. So you know, I guess it's a different philosophy. Do you encourage business to come in and then build the infrastructure or then plan at that point or plan it up front and attract the uh, uh, businesses, which, it, you know, I think it's, it's working for West Sacramento. But um, I do appreciate your, your efforts in putting this together. Fully supportive of it. Mr. Christoph. Yeah, yeah Shanna. Um I, I guess I guess my thoughts on when I read this were maybe a little bit different than the rest of the councils, and and I and I related it to two major projects that not too long ago this this council heard. We heard the Richland project and the Yarborough project, and one of the major issues on both of those projects were traffic impact fees, and was it. One lane of traffic, two lanes of traffic, was it a bridge, was it uh, whatever it may be that these traffic impact fees are going to go for? And if we reduce, and, and so we, we, we approved the project because, I mean, we thought that there would be adequate traffic mitigations for the number of homes that were going to be constructed or, uh, you know, or for the businesses that were going to be produced. There was going to be um, it wasn't going to be gridlock. Now we reduce everything by just about 25 percent. So what would have happened to those major projects if this philosophical approach was adhered to then? Would we have had to re say, well, you know, we are going to have level of service D, E, and F at this, 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 and this. Uh, we're not going to be able to get the um, uh, South River Road Bridge in in 2000 and, and, and 15 or 20. It's going to have to wait until uh, 2080 or something like that. W what, what does it mean? Well, I think there's, I think there's two ways to think about that. Um, you know, one is... <clears throat> A reduction in the fees is going to mean that you're going to collect money, but you're going to collect less money over time. So there would be delays on those projects. We're also seeing delays in the revenue collection due to the recession. The other is, and then you know, Charlene may want to step in, but those projects do have requirements to um, revise the fee programs and re revise the infrastructure master plans when they come in, and, and all of that would be taken a look at. Charlene, do you want to add anything? Yes, that is correct. Um, in addition to what Shanna indicated, um, they both those projects have EIRs uh, mm -hmm. with traffic studies that have certain triggers. Mm -hmm. Say, for instance, on South River Road Bridge, which essentially says, until that's built, you can't go beyond mm -hmm. so many units collectively in sure. Southport. And so in their development agreements, the way they were worded um, is that they not only would do the updated um, nexus studies and fee programs to include their projects, but if there weren't fees available to fund those improvements, that they would have to construct them th mm -hmm. themselves and wait for reimbursement uh, from the fee programs and or not build mm -hmm. okay. once they hit those triggers. So um, I don't know I mean, if- I, I guess- since I've been here since day one, the community, our community has had a tremendous amount of need because of the neglect that we had gone through under the auspices of the county. I mean, we didn't have a park system in, that was, you know, really um, what you could call a park system. I mean, West knows, you know, I mean, we, we didn't have that. We didn't have. Um, uh, you know, a lot of the uh, amenities that many other communities had. And so, so we started from a place that was a little further away than, than most people or most communities. And so we put these fees in place so that we could have a nicer park and we could, you know, keep up with what is going on within the region, so to speak. 
I mean, I, I support what you're doing. I, I really do, because I understand the times and, and, and I understand the economic times that we're in, and I understand, understand that. But at the same time, it's just that there was such a need to build these amenities that, you know, we had these, uh, we, we had fees. And now you want to reduce, you know, 15, I mean, 20, 20, Five percent on a traffic impact fee. I mean, that's that's a huge reduction. Uh, that's saving somebody a whole lot of money, and I understand that. And you know, and I, I really don't have too much problem with it. But at the same time, I want to make sure that because we reduce somebody's traffic impact fee by twenty-five percent. I don't only get one lane instead of two lanes so that I've got to wait four or five lights before I can get through. I just want to make sure that the nexus is going to be there. I mean, if, if uh, and I think that our general plan is a perfect place to at least flush out some of this stuff. And so I think it is a very good place because we'll talk about levels of service. We'll talk about whatever it, uh, it may be, parklands, uh, trails, whatever it is. So, I mean, I think that that's a good place to start, but at the same time, we're going to be, need to be cognizant of the fact that our fee structure is going to only allow so much. And so, you know, I mean, it's, it's damned if you do, damned if you don't, I guess. I don't know. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I wasn't here at day one, but I was here when the, when the last recession turned and we had permitted lots of new development Bridgeway uh, Island and elsewhere, Newport Estates uh, and, what, and what have you, and residents want to know where their infrastructure was. And we didn't have the money because we had made a determination that in the recession that we needed to be competitive and provide incentives for development to occur. And uh, whether or not that was the, the right decision or not, it may have been the only thing that could have at that time stimulated that development to occur at all. And I think that's probably the case. But we're not in that. We're not in that position. We're in a much stronger market position vis-a-vis um, -vis other players in the region coming out of this recession than we were in, in at coming out of that one. Uh, and so we, I think, in the last generation, we no, we no longer have to compete on price in this in the same way. Which isn't to say that we should not care what our fees are, because we obviously do, and we're, and we're doing this work. But I, but. Um, I, I'm just, I, I'm not convinced about the, you know, the, the, the power of this, but we need, to, we need to be doing it anyway. Getting under the hood, you know, seeing, and, and I guess if, if this does come back, I'd, I'd like to see some of the, you know, a spreadsheet or something with the numbers, because it's in, some of the numbers are in the, the uh, interim study. And as I'm looking at it, it seems like one of the major sources of external funding that we're talking about, when we talk about state and federal grants, is actually us, right? It's redevelopment agency money that we pay um, not because we made a decision that for the Riverfront Park or for the E Street to I Street Bridge formal promenade um, or for many of these other projects that they should be funded out of redevelopment instead of park impact fees. It's because we had a zero balance in the park impact fee and the project couldn't happen unless we used redevelopment for that to occur. Um, and, and so those, those are examples of projects here where we're saying because the redevelopment, pay, it, re redevelopment paid for it, it's not an obligation on park impact fees and therefore we don't need that fee revenue. That, that conceptually, logically, that doesn't make sense to me because we never made the decision that we thought that those were redevelopment projects. We just made the decision that we've got these grants from Prop 50 and we need money right now to build these projects. And so that, that, that and, and the only place, the only source that we had was redevelopment. Um, so I'm not, that, that to me, it seems like we're, we're are cannibalizing redevelopment, uh, which is already, you know, severely under duress because of the actions at the state level. And it seems like it's the same thing under the, um, the Tower Bridge Gateway element. So Tower Bridge Gateway, we would um, say the we we pull out the money, whatever redevelopment didn't spend is what we'll we'll we'll, we'll pull out. That was, that's what what the traffic impact fee is going to pay for. And the same thing on the the tra Tower Bridge Gateway phase phase two. And again, I mean, I think you know we 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 put redevelopment dollars into these pots in order to make these projects possible. We didn't make a, nobody came here and asked us to make a policy decision that we should use redevelopment to permanently buy out um, the, the contribution of development to either Tower Bridge Gateway or to these riverfront park projects. So I, it, it just would be helpful in a spreadsheet to see the, the, log, the you know, how this all adds up, because you have the dollars on some of the, on the big projects, 
where most of the money, I mean, even if you took all the ones out that I just said, you'd still be, get very large reductions in these fees. They're not $50 million here, $25 million there. Um, but I'm not, you know, especially given the conversation we had about the development agreement, I'm not really in a position to say, let's, let's e even further um, take money out of, <laughs> out of redevelopment to offset development <coughs> impact fees. We can do that. We, can, we always have the flexibility to do that in the future. But to build it into the underlying financing mechanism, I think, is problematic. The other question I have is on the, on the two interchanges. So, um, so with the Jefferson interchange, these are the two, what we know are going to be the two most problematic points of traffic and congestion in the city for, um, for, uh, our, grand, for our children and grandchildren. This is, these are the two worst choke points in the city. So we want to make sure that we're not, in a, we're not putting the city council in, in 15 years when Mr. Kristoff is here in a position where we have not made plans today as, as we've approved development to be able to fund those projects. With Jefferson, you're proposing that we take out $10 million from the project because we would, doing it, we would do it as a later phase, but we would still, it still has to be done. So in, at, at that stage, we would then say new development at that point is going to have to pay even more because we can't go back. Um, but we also can't ask that new development to pay the costs associated with the, which, with what would at that point be existing development. So I, I, don't, I don't quite understand the, the logic behind saying that if we just phase it, then we don't have to charge people for it. The, this study, I think the focus is, is interim, so we're looking at, uh, you know, at the most two and a half years before we go back and revisit it. Um, and so with, let's just say it's two and a half years. And at that point, we do have the resources and the funding to do some uh, updates to our master plans. Then we would take a look at all of the actual facilities that we need to, to build according to our general plan and our, and our master plan and our vision. And then we would recalculate what the fee is and put the full amount into the fee at that point in time or consider putting the full amount in. Um, the idea of the interim fee is to say, okay, during this, this shortened time period, let's defer a portion of those costs and not collect at this point for the, for the full amount. But then why not do that on every part? I mean, what, what's, what's the methodological justification f for, for doing that? I think that these two interchanges were the ones that jumped out at us as being clearly ones that, that were in a longer time frame and that we could, we could afford to make that reduction at this point in time. I, yeah, thanks, Mr. Moore. I, I guess for me, and that's part of why I, I just I have a hard, I circle back multiple times with why I think this is a great idea and why I think it's a horrible idea at the same time. And I guess I just have a hard time imagining <clears throat> us ever in a position. And I certainly haven't been on the ten years I've been here, where we where the increase in fees to catch back up to what I thought we had as sort of tier one plans is an easy thing to do. It's never easy. It's always a fight. It's a fight amongst ourselves, let alone with the chamber and with the folks who have to adjust to the increase in fees. I have no reason, at least at this point, to believe that in decreasing fees by 20, 25, 15 uh, percent respectively are, is going to do, I, I'd like to think that it would, but I just have no reason to believe at this point that it's going to do anything other than decrease the fees. I, there's no way for me to say in two or three years, X percent of increased development would occur because of a reduction in fees. And I, and I know that's the intent, and I, and I know that part of this has been driven by what I think I've seen repeatedly in the staff report to say it's a result of the economic downturn, which for me, I guess at then I would need to see, well, what are the indicators that we're going to track regularly and closely to say, okay, now we're starting to turn and the fees need to increase proportionately so that we can keep up with the original, and I call them tier one for lack of a better term, but the tier one, sort of the optimum infrastructure goals, policies, and procedures that we wanted to have in place. And I just, I, I can't track it enough to say that it, the only time we'll come back here to have that conversation is when we're behind the curve and we realize that our aspirations are not gonna be met by the current fee structure that's in place because we're 25, 20 and 15 percent behind the curve, respectively. And I guess I just I struggle. I, I can't. I just I don't know at what point we would we would do that unless there was some clear roadmap that said these are the indicators that then say we're now at a point where we we have to start catching up either incrementally or in total right right away in order to realize what we laid out as sort of our vision. 
and I, I just, I, and I've just, in, just in listening the last 20 minutes, I struggled to sort of answer that question for myself. Let me offer a, a possible thought process. It, it's certainly something that Shanna just, uh, struggled with, and we talked about it a good deal. Um, some portion of these reductions are clearly justified by the fact that we did fund projects differently than we anticipated, and, and that. And, I, and Shannon would probably be able to give you a better calibration of that than I would. But I would say that probably does represent the single largest component, but it's not the only component at all. I think your point is well taken. Are we going to lose revenue? The answer is likely that we will lose a bit of revenue. The offsetting factor there is that we are going to have such low levels of development in the next two to three years that the amount of revenue that we lose is going to be relatively small compared to the total build-out potential of the city. Um, and we will be, I think, monitoring very closely. If we start to see the uptick in permit ap activity and that sort of thing, that would be the trigger for us to say, okay, now we, now we can justify the full nexus study, which we should be doing, to uh, justify new fees. The reality is you'd, you'd like to do nexus studies at least every five years, if not more frequently than that. Well, it's been five years since we've done one, and that one was a really a makeshift one. It wasn't a full nexus study. So if we were building at the rates we were building in 2005, we would already done a nexus study, and we'd be at different rates. Some would have been lower, some would have been higher, but we'd be at different ones. We can't justify that at this point. But our comfort level about these reductions is that it's going to represent a small percentage of the build-out because it's going to apply to a time in our existence when very little development work will occur. And so I think that's why we feel more comfortable about it. Um, if you were to say this is what we're going to do for the next 10 years, I think both Shannon and I would be very uncomfortable that this is the right uh, approach. Okay, so so okay, so, that, so that's helpful. I mean, I think the idea um, where other funds are are, are are secured that makes sense. I, I think that that I, that I can I can I can understand the idea that you would then just sort of reduce fees, knowing full well that development is going to be low anyhow. I, maybe I struggle a little bit with that. I mean, it's almost sort of a ceremonial sort of what we're trying to do something, knowing it really isn't going to result in much of anything if, if it's going to be so low. And I, maybe I'm overstating that a little bit, but I still think I track that. The part that I struggle with, I think, then mostly is capturing that uptick. So what are the indicators? I mean, obviously, applications and, you know, interest and that sort of thing are something to consider. But I just it seems like there's never a, a fun time to increase fees, and there's never a consensus, at least not by both sides of the aisle, to say, okay, now is the time to capture it, because some folks see it as an opportunity to, to strike quickly while you still can, because it's not gonna last, and others see it as you're gonna stifle what is a good thing, and so there's no, you know, so, so that conversation mm -hmm. I've sat through three or four or five times now, so I know that's, that's the reality of it. So I guess I just would probably feel more comfortable if I knew that there was agreement, if there's agreement this evening on doing this, it would seem to me that there probably ought to be some mechanism in place to say, okay, and here are the indicators that we ought to all agree on that at some point we need to revisit this issue to capture what would otherwise be, you know, the catch-up game which we typically play and we miss out on opportunities that mm -hmm. might have existed. Does that make sense? I mean, I, I guess that's for me is what I'm looking for and I just... I don't know if that's in place, or maybe that just overcomplicates an already complicated. It, it's change. not formal, but um, remember the bridge district is probably a little bit outside of this question because they have a whole different financing mechanism. Um, but for the balance of the city, we are constrained in the numbers that we can anticipate by not only the external market but by the flood issues. And so I think that there will be. You know, if we start to have more, substantially more than a, a few hundred units a year, that will trigger a lot of people's attention. And that will be, in my judgment, the time where we can say, okay, now it's time to have it. And as Charlene mentioned, embedded in the development <coughs> agreements of the big developments, which is what it would take to get a lot of units, mm -hmm. are requirements that they fund 
vesting, uh, fund the uh, studies, the impact fees, the nexus studies. And so that would be the mechanism. They want to get permits, now they have to fund the studies. Uh, so there are some, I think, in uh, integrated systems there that would prevent it from going over. Uh, right now, I mean, we just can't rationalize in our own mind asking the council to go do a, an exit study. You know, mm -hmm. it's a mm -hmm. you know three or four hundred thousand dollar study. No, I understand that. Um, right. We have better places to put the money. Well, I guess for me, I, and the Bridge District is a perfect example. I just don't want. I know the conversation we had in November um, distinctly about um, one of the ap the applicant said very clearly that th that the only way to move forward will be to basically agree that we cannot have the, and I'm using this as a lack, for lack of a better term, the tier one optimum uh, infrastructure components to the, to the district. Mm -hmm. And I think we all said, okay, well, we can live with that if, 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 so if, mm -hmm. if the climate doesn't warrant the kinds of revenue that we would otherwise need. And I guess I just want to memorialize that and capture that as we go through this exercise so that we don't lose sight of it, so that at some point, if things do change, we are able, able to double back and may say, make sure we do want to include the level of infrastructure that we had envisioned in the plan, because invariably, it gets watered down, not watered up. Right. And I just, I, I just I want to make sure we're not losing that. I, I think that, that your concern is shared by staff. Yeah, I mean, I would be more assured if there was a letter from the chamber that said that, right? Because the. If, even if we get back to a nexus study, there will be intense pressure to reduce the amount of infrastructure, not to change the level. You know, and do it, say, say we just try to get back to something approaching this fee. You know, they would go, you know, berserk if we, if you came to us, you and Shanna, Walt stood in here one day and said we'd like to increase, increase. fees by twenty percent. Yeah. How dare you consider a fee change of that magnitude? Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so, I mean, this just it, this substantially changes the framing of that discussion. Um, which will occur long after any of us, but Mr. Christopher mm -hmm. is still here. And I, so that, I'm just trying to be sensitive to that um, for, for all the best intentions and our understanding of what the debate should be like, that that's, it's, it's going to be intense pressure to not do um, what, we're, what we're describing. Because there are always, even, in the, even when it was booming, and developers are, were increasing the price of their homes by $300,000 and then coming here and complaining about a $500 Increase in the you know in the stormwater fee or whatever it was, saying that that five hundred dollars was going to put people out of their homes, um, and you know and make the market fall apart. That's just I mean that's just that's their job. I mean they're, they're, you know we don't ask developers to come here and, and be advocates for city finances, but um, you know I, I, I mean, we ought to know what, what to expect that debate's going to look like. So, Mr. Christoph. Yeah. Well, I guess that I mean I, I know that there's going to be the time when things do turn around and we're going to come back for. Uh, additional. I mean, it won't be the 22 percent. I mean, it comes back in smaller increments. It's come back some five, seven percent increase, whatever it may be. I, I, I guess the uh, one of the things that Oscar and I can probably do, and that is going to be, we're going to bring this staff report with us when we come, <laughs> because it's going to say gonna February 17, 2010, <laughs> and this was the reduction. But that's what it's going to take for people to remember. Uh, and we're, you know, we're three, four, five years out before we're going to have any of those other increases. So we better have something in our hand that says, remember those days. Thank okay. you. And, and, and the reason I bring it up only because, and not, not to beat a, uh, you know, a dead horse, but this council I know repeatedly asked for a, 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 a um, uh, a chart, I guess, if you will, of the the city's investment in the trying of the riverfront or the uh, river district, because the question came up at least over the last ten years about you know the cost of doing business, which we know is very expensive, and that's that's a given. But the city's investment all along those ten years, at least, has been substantial. I mean, there's nights where the numbers are just staggering in terms of what our commitment is. And then a week or month goes by, and, and, and the conversation almost seems to get lost, and we kind of almost seem like we're starting over on, on, on several nights. And I've asked for, at least um, repeatedly, to see if I could get a, a sort of a capturing of all of that investment so that it's 
front and center for everybody having the conversation so that we don't have to you know, remind ourselves of kind of what those are. And I know you guys are doing a million things, so I know what the numbers are. I don't have to, but I, it's just nice to have them in front of us as we're having that conversation to not have to uh, defend the city's uh, commitment to. Uh, in my head, I do have the chart put together. I just, yeah. 50 million. I, 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 <laughs> So I, that's why I, I'm hammering down on this one because this is another one of those that, as Bill says, people, people will forget. We may, may be able to come back with uh, a bit of a preamble that would really argue that this is a, a lowering below, below what could be justified and, it, and reemphasize the, the nature of interim fees to at least give the elected officials at the time you next consider an increase that language that says, we understood what we were doing and we were doing this, we weren't doing something else. Well, the new people are gonna kick our <laughs> so <laughs> the only other request I'd make for is for when, uh, assuming that we can that continue this, that when it comes back, if you could give us a, give us these same numbers, if you subtracted out those areas where it's the redevelopment agency, if, if we repay the redevelopment agency for Tower Bridge Gateway the, the, and the two Riverfront Park um, elements, if redevelopment was, was, was fully covered, then what would the reductions be? Yeah, we can do that. Okay, great. All right, is there any objection to continuing this to our next meeting? Yes, nice. we've said that. Okay. All right, thank you. Thanks very much to the, to the staff. Uh, the, the folks of the chamber have been working very hard on the details of this with our staff team over, the, over a very long time. I think, you know, we're clearly, I think there's interest in getting there, so we'll hopefully two weeks, so. All right, Council of Calendar, Ms. Richardson. Uh, yes, Mr. Mayor, this is our last meeting of the month. We won't be meeting again until um, March 3rd. And on that night, the, the fire department will be having another um, graduation of their CERT class. And I believe the council has invitations on the DS there. And somebody will probably be calling you um, this week to confirm your attendance or not. And then on uh, tomorrow, the HTC meeting is listed at, at 4 p.m. and that has been moved to 11 a.m. All right, any questions on the calendar? City manager report. Yes, I wanted to alert the council to the fact that we're going to initiate a, another round of information sharing with our employees regarding not only um, the results of the council's strategic planning session and workshop uh, this past month, but also our financial standing. Um, and then we'll be initiating the service evaluation that the council identified as priority and that process will uh, commence almost immediately. All right, other question, questions on the city manager report? City attorney report? Okay. Staff direction from members of the council. Maybe I could lead off with this. I sent a note to the city manager about this Google Fiber um, issue. Um, and I don't know, uh, the, I'm, I'm not sure if the council's aware, but Google has announced, uh, they've uh, put out a request for information to communities throughout the country uh, Google says it's interested in doing a, a ultra high speed um, uh, networking in one or more communities serving 50 to, to 500,000 people in total across the country. And they put that on the, uh, they just announced it last week, put it out on the web. I think the deadline for that for responses is, is in uh, the latter part of March. Um, and there's already uh, here, you know, a lot of uh, grassroots interest in it. and. Quite, quite honestly, in about seven, now about, I think now 780 cities across the country, so it, we would not be alone, in, but uh, mm -hmm. to ask the city manager about um, whether or not th this is worth um, exploring and, and, and or agendizing for March, because if we were to submit, a, if we were to respond to the RFI, um, I think it would require the council's consent, correct? We, we've just received the application forms and we're examining them to see whether um, it would be difficult to apply and also whether we would be competitive. Okay, and I think I've communicated there's a, there's a, a couple of um, connected groups of people both on the internet and other and elsewhere that are community residents and I think some business owners that are that I, that are also working on you know building a case and and uh, making you know, uh, it, it, citizens are also able to nominate their communities to Google, um, but um, they're, they've you know broadly volunteered to to help if uh, uh, you know if we get to the stage. Where, uh, where we believe it's worth staff resources to be able to prepare the application to, 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 you know, to assist in that effort. And there is you know, a fairly broad and deep um, level of uh, uh, resources and talent among some of our residents. So if, if we get to that point, I, uh, I, I, well, even before then, I'll, I know other council members have been in communication with them too, but we can forward 
uh, contact information and if there's if we get to a point where a meeting you know community meeting is, is helpful then uh, um, that, 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 that seems like an appropriate way to, to go we obviously if, the, if, if your assessment is we would be completely non-competitive um, or we're missing some key element that would be necessary to construct such an ultra high-speed network then we can't obviously can't afford to go after every opportunity but it's worth a staff evaluation Mr. Johansson yeah I'd just like to chime in on that the um, applications actually do March 26 and apparently it's a four-hour process to complete the, app the application for a municipality. But one of the things I noticed in here is that um, it's, it's a service for um, at a competitive price to at least 50,000 and potentially up to 500,000 people. So West Sacramento is on the low end of that scale. So, um, but I would, I would concur that um, we should uh, take a look at this application and get back to us on, on you know the cost of preparing the application and, and I, I think what they're also looking for is the uh, dedication of the city right. in providing Wi-Fi or internet access outside of this program to kind of augment that and I know we've um, there's a number of groups working particularly in Brighton Broderick on uh, developing some type of uh, Wi-Fi mm -hmm. web in there to um, we've talked about the Housing Development Corporation to incorporate Wi-Fi in the um, affordable housing units so there is an interest um, in doing this, um, not just uh, you know in the newer parts of town, but in the older parts of town as well. So definitely worth look, looking into. Okay, other staff direction items? We have no future agenda item requests. Mr. Beers moves and second. Mr. Johannes and seconds. So this is me to be adjourned. Seeing no discussion, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed, hearing none. Motion carries. Meeting is adjourned.